me. Oh. To me. Uh -huh. Wait. She's at home, and I have to go to her house. This one, she's coming. Thank you very much, police band.
Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again. You are all warmly welcome to the inaugural lecture in honor of our late DG, Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima. As we prepare to commence the ceremony, I would like to acknowledge the presence of each and every one of you here. Distinguished participants, gaily dressed and seated at the gallery, you are welcome. I have in our midst, if you want to appreciate them, go ahead. <laughs> Let me quickly appreciate the presence of Barista Mohamed Obaduma Aliu, Secretary to the Government of Nasarawa State, is seated here representing His Excellency, the Governor of Nasarawa State. Please make him welcome. We have in our midst as well, His Royal Highness, Yakubu Chiamang Ata Aten Gwawuri, the rep of Bongonjos. Please welcome him. <laughs> Let me use this opportunity to appreciate our esteemed faculty, NIPS faculty. They are here seated. You're all welcome. I can see General Kanoma. You're welcome, sir. I can see Professor Fatai Arimu. And I'm sure the others will join up shortly. You're welcome. The fellows in our midst, um, I would like to quickly uh, appreciate their presence. Some will join up later. I think I can see one or two of them. But I'll generally appreciate the fellows. And as they come in, we pick them one after the other to uh, acknowledge. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our DDs in our midst, and all other senior staff, you're all warmly welcome. Continue. <coughs> Police band, please.
photography, are we going to leave? No, no, no. Uh, professor, how do we take it? Professor, Professor Gambo. Okay. Major General DC, for Miss Billy. Operation Save Heaven Commander, representing Chief of Defense Staff. Yes, it's, it's here. Okay, you are ready to answer? Major General DC. President, IGP Adamu. No, at his college, IGP is Adamu. So what's his name? No, that one too is Adamu. No, MD Abubakar. I can't remember MD Abubakar. MD Abubakar. So what's the vice president's name? I'm the vice president. I saw him not long ago. He's a one ambassador like that. So I need the
Please rise for the national anthem. The national anthem, please. seated. His Excellency, President Mohamedou Buhari, GCFR, here represented by His Excellency, Professor Yemi Usibanjo, SAN, GCON, Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria. His Excellency, the Governor of Plateau State, Right Honorable Simon Baku Lalong, ably represented by the head of service, Mr. Azi Izang MNI. His Excellency, the Governor of Nasarawa State, Engineer Abdullahi Suli. Deputy Governors here present, members of the National and State Assemblies, members of the Federal and Executive Council, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, the interim chairman and members of the NIPS Board of Governors, Chief of Defense Staff, Heads of Security and Military Services here present, Chief Executives of the Federal and State Agencies, the Gwangwam Joss and other royal fathers here present, the President, Alumni Associ Association of the National Institute, 
and the executive members of the association, management staff and principal officers of the National Institute, my lords, spiritual and temporal, respected invited guests, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, without leaving out the family of our late um, DG, members of the Professor Abu Galadima uh, family. You are all welcome warmly to the inaugural lecture in honor of our late DG, Professor, late Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima. My name is Sandra Agbo, and I'll be working in this bit with uh, my colleague and sister, Bumi Okonoda. You're all welcome. Let me acknowledge the presence of the Plateau State Governor, Honorable Simon Bakulalon, ably represented by his head of service, Mr. Azi Izang MNI. Please make him welcome. His Excellency Governor of Nasarawa State, Engineer A. A. Abdullahi, Engineer Abdullahi, ably represented by the SSG, the Secretary of Government, please. We'll correct that later, sir. You're welcome, sir. Chief of the Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General Irabo, ably represented by the STF Commander, Major General Onwunyelu. Onwunyelu, am I right? Onyewulu, you're welcome, sir. Please appreciate him. The Acting Director General of the National Institute, Brigadier General Udaya, retired, PLSC Daga, MNI. The Bongon Joss, ably represented by His Royal Highness Yakubu Chairman, the Atta Aten Gwawuri. You're welcome, sir. We appreciate the presence of the Chairman and members of NIP's Board of Governors. You are all welcome. The President of ANI, IGP, MD, Abubakar, MNI, is ably represented here by the Vice President of the Association, Ambassador Emmanuel Obi Okafo, MNI. You are welcome, sir. Distinguished guest lecturers in our midst, Professor Augustine Ikelegbe, from the University of Bini. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> Professor Sam Egu, resident electoral commissioner, Niger State. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> we appreciate the, the, the presence of the families of the late Director General, Professor Abu Galadima, in our midst. You're all welcome. <laughs> the Director of Studies, Professor O.J. Paramalam, MNI. You're welcome, man. We appreciate the presence of the Director of Research in the person of Professor Dun Pan Sha. You're welcome, sir. And of course, seated immediately to um, Shah's right is the Institute Liberian Dr. Emmanuel Mama MNI. You're welcome, sir. May I, at this point, kindly request or invite the Acting Director General of the National Institute, Brigadier General CFJ Udaya MNI, to give his welcome address. Okay. Sorry, sir, before you come up, we are to observe a one minute silence for the late DJ. Please, may I request that we all rise? May his gentle soul rest in peace. Thank you very much. Please be seated. The acting DG, please. Our special guest of honor this morning, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 
Professor Yemi Osibanjo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Grand Commander Order of the Niger, the Governor of Plateau State, Right Honorable Simon Bakola Long, ably represented by the Chief of Staff, by the Head of Service, the Governor of Nasrawa State, ably represented by the Secretary to the State Government, the Chief of Defense Staff and Chairman Interim Board of Governors of the National Institute, ably represented by Commander Special Task Force OP Safe Heaven, Major General Onyemulu, the family of our late Director General, the Gwom Gwom Joss, President of the Alumni Association of the National Institute, our distinguished guest lecturers, members of board of the National Institute, management staff of the National Institute, members of directing staff, senior fellows and staff of the National Institute here present, participants of the Senior Executive Course 43, 2021, and PPL, PSLC, distinguished invited guests, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our special guest of honor and distinguished invited guests to, this, to the National Institute for today's occasion. Today, the National Institute is celebrating one of its most br brilliant minds, Professor Habu Shaibu Galadima. Today's memorial lecture is put together by the National Institute and the friends of Professor Galadima in his honor it is the first of its kind ever in the National Institute. The theme of this memorial lecture was carefully selected to bring out the academic area of interest of our dearly departed Director General and showcase his personality. Professor Galadima, may his gentle soul rest in peace was different things to different to everyone seated in this hall. He was a husband, a father, a brother, a son, a teacher, a boss, a colleague, a friend, and in fact, for members of the Senior Executive 43 seated here, he was instrumental to processing your admission. He was to me a senior brother, a teacher, a boss, and a friend. I've worked closely with Professor Galadima in many respects. He was director of research, and I was a participant in 2015. He was chair of an assessment panel while I was the internal examiner. We traveled together on local and African study tour, where he was the team leader, and I was the directing staff. And in the last one year, I've worked closely with him as his secretary and director of administration, and he was the director general. In all this, I've come to see a gentleman who loves his family. He's passionate about academics and intellectualism the development of subordinates and the likes, the National Institute and the nation at large. When I reflect about the life of Professor Galadima, for the few years I've come to know him, I seem to think he knew he was going to leave us soon. Professor Galadima, as Director General, accomplished so much in the less than one year he was the Chief Executive Officer of the National Institute. It was as if he was in a hurry to get everything done. He attracted so many state governments 
and institutions to donate building projects to the National Institute. He initiated the implementation of the NIP strategic plan. This hall, for many years after completion, was only used for graduation. He moved the directorate of study here, and by the grace of God, the senior executive course plenary takes place here. He concluded works on the NIPS condition of service. He concluded discussions on the employment of new staff for the National Institute. This has been something that has been ongoing for so many years. Professor Gladima initiated and entered into agreements with renowned institutions and organizations for the benefit of the National Institute, some of which are represented here today. He was a man of vision. I recall in April 2020, when COVID was just beginning and everyone was scared and unsure of how to proceed. The participants of the Senior Executive Course 42 were divided on whether to remain on campus or go back to their various organizations. Management and staff were equally very much divided on the same issue, and there was so much pressure. Professor Galadima was the lone voice in management that insisted that the course must continue. We then worked on some measures to improve on the containment of the disease. As a result of this decision, we were able to pilot the Senior Executive Course 42 to a successful landing. In the process, the career of so many officers and gentlemen on that course was not truncated. You can imagine what would have become the consequence of the Senior Executive Course program if that decision was not taken. I'm sure by now the SEC program would have been scrapped. Professor Galadima had a restless mind. He wanted to see everything perfect. He thought of everything from the quality of paper he used to the quality of food for participants and staff to the functioning of air condition in this auditorium, the position of flowers and flags. He wanted to do everything, and in fact, he managed to do everything. When we were preparing for the graduation of the Senior Executive Course 42, everyone wanted the graduation to take place in this hall for obvious reasons. One, it's beautiful. Two, it was easy to decorate, and we do not need to do much work to make it easy, ready for graduation. But that was not Galadima's way. He directed against the wishes of most people, especially the participants, that the graduation be conducted in the open field. Many representations were sent to him in order to rescind the decision. You need to see the state of the field at the time and graduation was a few days away. We went to work and changed the field in a couple of days. And I must say with all sense of sincerity that the graduation was the most colorful I've witnessed in over five to six years of my stay and relationship with the National Institute. Professor Galadima battled COVID in order to ensure that the Senior Executive Course 42 was not aborted. We complied with the Presidential Task Force directives. He directed the setting up of a COVID committee. He introduced the mandatory testing and quarantine of participants and staff who traveled outside of JAWS for more than 24 hours. I equally knew that the reason for his directing that the graduation ceremony take place in the open field was because of the COVID-19. In his wisdom, he felt if any of the guests came to the hall with the infection, you can imagine the consequences if it were held in the hall. Unfortunately, when death came calling, it was through the instrumentality of a disease he worked so hard to keep at bay, COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you all my experience with this great leader, father, husband, teacher, administrator, and academician. In an ordinary welcome speech as this, I can't even tell you better of him 
because I'm certain that everyone here has some experience to share of his or her relationship with this gentleman who has affected so many people in his little sojourn in this world. May I once more, on behalf of the Board of Governors, management, staff, and participants of the National Institute, welcome our special guest of honor and all invited guests to this first memorial to this first memorial lecture ever organized in the National Institute in honor of our dearly departed Director General, Professor Habu Shaibu Galadima. May his gentle soul rest in perfect peace. You're welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, can we please make appreciated the Acting Director General with a round of applause. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on the already established protocol. Before I go on to the next item on the agenda, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the representative of the Chinese Embassy and uh, the European Union who have joined us via Zoom. You are most welcome. Please give them a round of applause. I appreciate them for linking with us via Zoom. Now that we have heard from the Acting Director General about a man whose short sojourn at the National Institute has transformed the landscape and its intellectual content, it is time to hear from another man of many positive parts in the firmament of social engineering an astute administrator who I, whom I recall was seated beside the man whom we are gathered to remember and celebrate here today. There can be no other person apart from the family who would feel the passing of late Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima than His Excellency Right Honorable Simon Bakulalong, Governor of Plateau State, who is ably represented here today by the Head of Service, Mr. Izang Azi. Please, I would like you all to please most courteously help me recognize and welcome Mr. Izang Azi to the podium for his remarks. Special guest of honor, Professor Yemi Osibanjo, the Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, the family of our late Director General, Professor Abu Galadima, distinguished invited guest, ladies and gentlemen. Given the close relationship between His Excellency Right Honorable Simon Bakola Long and the late Director General of this institute, Professor Abu Galadima, he would have loved to be here in person to honor this occasion. But due to some other pressing official engagements, he has asked that I represent him here. So on his behalf, I want to say good morning to all of you here. I want to also, on behalf of His Excellency, once again, convey his sympathy and that of the government and people of Plateau State to his family and to the NIPS community. May his soul rest in peace. It is said that it is not how long one lives, but how well. Professor Galadima was indeed an erudite scholar of great repute. 
his stay as the director general was not that long, but he made tremendous impact, just like we heard from the acting director general. He had indeed started restoring the lost glory of the institute and transforming it into greater heights. Let me therefore commend the institute for organizing this public lecture in honor of the late director general. Indeed, he so well deserved it. What you have done clearly fits into an address that was given by Abraham Lincoln, the American president. And he said, I quote, the world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Therefore, Professor Galadima will continue to be remembered for what he did here in Nibs. May, in, may his family and indeed the entire Nibs community find solace in the inspiring good works of our departed DG. Let us all remember that whatever position of leadership and responsibility we find ourselves, and no matter how short it may be, we should strive to leave positive impacts to be remembered with. The only way his legacy will continue to last long is for to continue with his, with his good works and to ensure that the recommendations arising from this lecture that is being organized in his honor is put into action. On this note, once again, accept the sympathy and condolences of His Excellency, Right Honorable Simon Bakolalo, the Governor of Plateau State. Thank you and God bless. Can we please appreciate His Excellency with another round of applause? Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is time to call on another eminent personality who is the leader of the state from which Professor Abu Gal Shaibu Galadima hails from. He is no other than the Executive Governor of Nasarawa State, ably represented here by Barrister Muhammad Uban Duma Aliyu, Secretary to the Governor of Nasarawa State. Your Excellency, sir. Efficient, the merciful. Your Excellency, the special guest of honor, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi of Shimbajo, SAN GCON. Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Plateau State, 
ably represented by the head of service, the acting DG, the representative of the Chief of Defense Staff. Your Excellency, permit me to adopt all the existing protocol. I'm here standing for my boss, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Nasrallah State, Engineer Abdullah A. Suley. He would have loved to be here personally, but because of some state matters, he has to stay away. But I have the privilege to read his address at this occasion. Let me express my profound appreciation to the Institute for conceiving the idea of staging this all important lecture in memory of our last son, Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima. Indeed, this is an acknowledgement of his worthy contributions to the academic excellence and policy development, not only to the Institute, but to our dear country. I note with appreciation the theme of this lecture, which is proliferation of small arms and the steaming conundrum of insecurity in Nigeria, prospects for control and sustainable security. The theme was rightly coined to reflect the antecedents of late Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima as a professor of political development and a lead consultant, Nigeria Small Arms and Light Weapons Survey. I need to add that the choice of this team is apt and timely. Coming at a time that the country is engulfed by the millions of insecurity associated with the proliferation of light arms and other weapons. I believe that the outcome of this lecture will give further perspectives to the commitment of President Muhammadu Buhari's administration to finding land, la lasting solutions to the myriad of insecurity challenges in the country. I consider this event as a mark of honor to the late professor who was known to be a prolific and astute researcher an international relations expert, a hardworking and compassionate leader whose legendary and uncommon legacies will remain indelible in the science of time. We may recall that Professor Abu Galadima started as a visiting professor to the institute where he rose through the ranks from the head of the Department of Security and the Directorate of Research, Director of Studies, to the apex position of the DG of the Institute. I am concerned that the late professor has demonstrated his academic prowess as a touring scholar, strategist, and astute administrator. Above all, he was indeed a patriotic Nigerian and gentleman who served his country, humanity, and God Almighty well throughout his lifetime. He died at a time when Nigeria needed his academic guidance, administrative dexterity, and inspirational leadership towards assisting in addressing the plethora of crisis facing our dear nation today. To us in Nasrallah State, we consider his demise a colossal loss, not only to the state, but also to the institute, the country, and the international community. As he was an international professor of no mean achievement, I am ennobled to say that Professor Abu Galadima always made us proud during his life, an academic sojourn. The government and people of Nasrallah State 
mourn the passage of this great and illustrious Nigerian who commiserate with the institute, who commiserate with the family, and indeed Nigeria as a whole, because it was a great loss to us to put our collective feeling in just a line. Professor Abu Galadima was a light that shone brightly and then went out. May God Almighty in his infinite mercy grant the soul of the professor a Janet Friedhaus. We thank you and may God bless you all. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, can you please appreciate the rep of His Excellency, the Nasara State Governor. Before we get to the next, next item, permit me to acknowledge the presence of His Royal Highness, Alaji Dr. Amado Aliu Oga, Onawu OON, the Andoma of Doma. Please appreciate him. As we've heard from the various remarks that have um, come on board, Professor, late Professor Shaibu Galadima is a man of many parts. Depends on the angle you are looking at him from. But the Institute has carefully selected a personality that has gone way, way back with him to give a biography that is telling us of the life and times of our late professor. And this person is no other than Professor Audunaven Gambo, a directing staff with the National Institute. Please, sir, you're welcome to give the biography of Professor, late Professor Shaibu Galadim. Your Excellency, Professor Yemi Osibanjo, SAN GCON, Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Your Excellencies, the Governors of Plateau State and Nassau States, heavily represented by the Head of Civil Service, Plateau State, and the Secretary to State Government, Nasra State. Other distinguished personalities, please kindly permit me to stand on the existing protocol for one of time. Uh, this is just an abridged version of the biography of late Professor Habu Shuaibu Galadima. Professor Habu Shahabu Galadima was born on the 24th of March, 1963, in total local government area of Nasra State, Nigeria. He received his primary education at Ashafa Abapa Primary School in total local government area. He later proceeded to Federal School of Arts and Science, Suleja. The young Galadima in search of higher education, found a sanctuary in the University of Jos in 1983, where he enrolled for a Bachelor of Science degree in political science. He obtained a BSc with honors in political science in 1987. Thereafter, he proceeded to River State between 1987 and 1988, where he did his mandatory National Youth Service Corps. In 1988, Professor Abu Galadima was motivated by the passion for knowledge to return to his alma mater for higher degree, where he registered for a Master of Science degree in International Relations and Strategic Studies. He was awarded the MSc in International Relations and Strategic Studies in 1990. No sooner had he obtained the MSc degree than he got appointed by the university as an assistant lecturer in the Department of Political Science, where he rose through the ranks 
to become a professor of international relations and strategic studies on October 1st, 2009. In the course of his working career, he was engaged as personal assistant to the Director General, Stroke Chief Executive Officer, Professor Jonah Isawa Elaigu, uh, when he was a DG of National Council on Intergovernmental Relations. He worked with the Professor Elaigu between 1992 and 1984 and resigned his appointment to return to the Department of Political Science. Professor Habu Galadima worked conscientiously and productively to get to the peak of his career at a very early age. He got his PhD in International Relations and Strategic Studies in 2006. He was at various times Deputy Director, Academic Planning of the University of Jos, Head of Department of Political Science, Coordinator of Departmental Program, and host of others. Professor Abu Galadima, his local and international exposures were very clear, judging by his appearances as guest lecturer on many national and international platforms. He was a consultant to many international organizations, such as Economic Community for West African States, ECOWAS, Department for International Development, DFID, World Bank, United Nations Development Program, Presidential Committee on Small Arms and Light Weapons. Professor Habu Galadima published over 50 articles in peer-reviewed journals and chapters in books nationally and internationally. Professor Habu Shehabu Galadima was the Director General Chief Executive Officer of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, Kuru, Nigeria's Apex Think Tank, from August 2019 to December 2020. A professor of political science took international relations and strategic studies, University of George, Professor Galadima has served as the director of research of the National Institute from 2015 to 2018, 2019, sorry, as well as the chief operating officer of the Political Parties Leadership and Policy Development Center of the Institute, an erudite scholar of no mean repute, and seasoned administrator, Professor Galadima, was had a PhD in International Relations and Strategic Studies from the University of Jos, Nigeria. He specialized, his specialties were in the area of political science, federalism, international relations, policy development, strategic studies, security, and peace studies. At various times, he was head Department of Defense and Security of the Directorate of Research National Institute in 2012, head Department of Political Science University of Jos between 2008 and 2011, Deputy Director, Academic Planning, Division of the University of Georgia in 2007, Assistant Director, Defense and Security Studies, Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, when he served there as a sabbatical fellow uh, in Abuja in 2004. Research Fellow, National Council on Intergovernmental Relations in Abuja uh, in 1993. Professor Galadima, was a member of the Governing Council of the National Institute for Cultural Orientation, Abuja, 2018. He was also a member of the Presidential Advisory Board, Advisory Team on Federalism, the Indian Conference in 2007. He was a member of the Northern States Governors Forum for Reconciliation, Healing, and security in 2017. And so many other sensitive appointments at the state and federal level. Professor Galadima was indeed a distinguished participant in numerous strategic and notable international training programs and workshops. Among others, he was a fellow Harvard Kennedy School 
Executive Education USA in 2018, participants at international workshop on human rights, peace and justice in Africa, organized by UPs at the Sababa, Ethiopia, April 2005, participants at ECOWAS Sub-Regional Small Arms and Light Weapons Survey Methodology Harmonization Training Workshop organized by ECOSAP in Bamako, Mali in May uh, 2007, a participant at the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research, PASGAR, and a, res a resource person for the curriculum development for the Collaborative Masters of Research and Public Policy program in August 2013, Nairobi, Kenya. He was also participant in conflict resolution and, ref and reforms in northern Nigeria. The NIFS Sky Direct Dialogue, Just Madison University, USA, 2012, Participants, the orientation in case study, teaching course organized by PASGA and, of course, our dear late Professor Galadima, we cannot mention all the strategic engagements he had at the international level due to uh, limited space. He was a member of several professional bodies, including International Political Science Association, Research Committee, Nigerian Political Science Association, Nigerian Society for International Affairs, International Board of Trustees, the Defense of Democracy Trust, Johannesburg, South Africa, and Board of Trustees, Global non-killing, USA. A widely published scholar, Professor Galadima, had numerous publications to his credit, including books, edited volumes, and articles in reputable journals. Some of the publications are Peace Building and Sustainable Human Security, The Nigerian Experience in African Renaissance 2006, Lessons for the Transition to Democracy in Africa, the Experience of the Military in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Nigeria, and Algeria, and article co-authored with Ricardo Laramon, the, the Causes of War and the Consequences of Peacekeeping in Africa. These are among several other publications that Time may not permit me to go through all of them. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Professor Galadima served as a consultant to several projects, locally and internationally, in the areas of peace and conflict, violent crimes, and social insecurity, ethnic mapping, local governments and Nigeria's federal system, small arms and light weapons, elections observation, political party administration, etc. Notably, he was Nigeria country coordinator, global dialogue on federalism, local government, and metropolitan regions, Forum of Federation, Canada, lead national small arms and light weapons review survey project coordinate consultants, Nigeria National Committee on Small Arms and Light Weapons, Minister of Defense, Lead Consultant, Nigeria National Security Strategy, NIF School in 20, between 2012 and 2013. He has served in numerous other capacities that time may not permit us to ex mention them all. He led and participated in numerous delegations of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies on the study tours to many countries, including France, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malawi, Namibia, Botswana, Tanzania, among several others. 
Professor Galadima was guest lecturer to notable institutions, including the National Defense College, Abuja, Nigeria Foreign Policy Academy in Lagos, Institute of Security Studies, Abuja, Portland State University, Oregon, USA, among others. He was happily married to his Hathrop, Hajia Aisha Abu Galadima, and the union was blessed with three beautiful children. He is survived by numerous brothers, sisters, uncles, and extended relations, many of whom are in our midst this morning. Professor Abu Galadima, may your soul find peaceful rest with God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Audu Nanve Gambo. Please, can you appreciate him once more? <laughs> he has actually painted a vivid picture of who our late prof was. A very tall figure. He said an erudite scholar, an administrator, and a strategist. We honor him any time of the day. Before we get to the next item, please let me quickly again appreciate um, some members of the National Institute staff, the NIPS faculty, we we'll call them the STEAM NIPS faculty. I'd like to acknowledge their presence. I can see Re, Admi Re Admira Jaiyo Laina, Miss, you're welcome, sir. Please appreciate them. I can see Professor Fatai Arimu. You're welcome, sir. Of course, General Kanoma, he works on them. You're welcome, sir. Let me acknowledge our fellows, fellows in our midst. If I'm leaving out a name, please. Oh, Professor <laughs> Tunji Olaokwa, an astute administrator, a one-time permanent secretary in the Federal Civil Service. You're welcome, sir. Let me acknowledge the presence of Professor Ifain Solomon Williams. Please appreciate him, whether he's in the house or not. Senior Fellow, Science, Technology, and Innovational Studies. We have Dr. Ishaku Aliu Dalhaj, Defense, Security, and International Studies. Please make him welcome. We have Mala Muazu Hassan Abdul, Political, Economic, and Social Studies Department. Let me acknowledge the presence of Dr. Maurice Ubunaya, is in charge of Defense, Security, and International Studies. Make him welcome, please. In the same vein, we welcome Dr. Motala Olani Yoke, in charge of Science, Technology, and Innovational Studies. He works with um, Professor Ifain Solomon. Please make him welcome. We have Dr. Grace Olusheyi Oshifowokon, Political, Economic, and Social Studies. We have uh, Mr. Chima, Elisha Nimfel, Political Science and Social Studies Department. Don't be too tired to appreciate them. Mr. Tanko Bulus Dabit, Defense, Security, and National Studies. Mr. Henry Chima Ukoma, Science, Technology, and Innovational Studies. Of course, we have Dr. Musa Umar, Chief Operating Officer, Political Parties, Leadership, and Policy Development Center. <laughs> Professor Shola Adeanju Amenai, of the head, is the head advancement um, department. You are all welcome. Still in the order of um, introductions, let me acknowledge our senior admin um, officers in our midst. I can see the head, general admin, Mrs. Madagu. You are welcome, Didi. The head of training department under the 
Human Resource Department, Mrs. Moltok. You're welcome. I can see the controller of work somewhere. Okay. Engineer um, Booker, you're all welcome. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me at this point to bring on board the special guest of honor of this occasion in the person of Professor Yemi Osibanjo, S-A-N, G-C-O-N, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to give his remarks and tribute to our lead DG. The Vice President, please. We'll be joining him via Zoom. Thank you. Our Chief Host, uh, His Excellency the Governor of Plateau State, the Right Honorable Simon Bakola Long, represented today by the Head of Service, Mr. Izan Asi, MNI, His Excellency the Governor of Nasara State, Engineer Abdullah Sule, represented by the Secretary to the State Government of Nasara State, Barrister um, Mohammed. Obandoma Ali, the Chief of Defense Staff Major General Lucky Rabo, represented by the Special Task Force Commander of the Plate of Plateau State, Major General DC Oyemulu, His Majesty the Gwangwong Joss Da Elder Jacob Giang Buba, CON, represented by His Royal Highness Chairman Atta Aten Ganawuri, the Andoma of Doma. The Acting Director General of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, NIPS, Brigadier General Chukwe Meka Odai, retired, MNI. The family of Professor Habu Galadima. Guest lecturers, Professor Augustine Ikelewe and Professor Sam Ego. Members of the Alumni Association of the National Institute. Senior staff and management of the National Institute. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. In the rather short period that I had to interact with him, Professor Galadima made a truly indelible impression on me. To start with, I could not but notice the fresh energy and the calm impetus that he brought to bear upon his duties as Director General of the National Institute. He had a deep conviction about the need to reposition the Institute as a country's foremost think tank and one of the leading institutions on the continent. And this reflected most vividly in the profundity of his thoughts and his diligence and devotion to his assignment as Director General. I came to learn that this was not a newfound path for Professor Galadima. All through his distinguished career, he had robustly engaged some of our nation's most pressing challenges, notably those revolving around conflict, peace building, security, federalism, and demilitarization. His intellectual interventions and research and conversations about the future of our nation always showed great hope. Born not just out of patriotism, but from his own lived experience, as a highly successful academic and public intellectual. His studies, his consulting, and teaching all around the Commonwealth and internationally clearly showed him the immense capabilities of our nation, and he never ceased to express this. He and I spoke about a new emphasis for the Institute, which is thinking through implementation, that we have to go beyond being a think tank. We have to become more of a do tank, of a do tank. I first met, I first met uh, Professor Galadima in 2015. He was then uh, a, a directing staff uh, when the then management staff and alumni of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies paid me a courtesy uh, visit and briefed me on the activities and challenges of the Institute. At the meeting, he easily distinguished himself as deeply reflective and forward thinking. And within the short period he served as Director General of the Institute, Professor Galadima built bridges of relationships 
of fellowships across intellectual divides and across every uh, all other known obstacles. He initiated various reforms aimed at repositioning the Institute to, accom to accomplish its mandates, including a review of the criteria for admission of candidates into the senior executive course and the quality of research works undertaken by the, uh, by, by the senior executive course participants. He also paid a great deal of attention to the welfare of the staff of the Institute. He constantly consulted with my office on ways to handle emerging challenges. And he struck me as a good team player who always carried his colleagues along in the implementation of the Institute's mandate. At what turned out to be our last meeting on December 3rd last year, Professor Galadima led members of the 42nd Senior Executive Course to the customary parley with Mr. President and ministers at the State House. As I recall very clearly, his comments and contributions were as usual incisive. And he opened the discussion and introduced the research report produced by the graduating students. Then as always, his desire for a greater Nigeria and a more impactful institute was clear and unmistakable. Thereafter, I had another session with him and the institute's management team uh, just later on that day. This time, the discussion focused on the Institute and its administration, strenuous efforts to make it better still. But sadly, that would be the last time that I would see him. But urgent personal matters and matters of state kept me from attending the graduation ceremony of the 42nd course. And that would be my first time in, in, in my years of, of uh, being the presiding, uh, of being guest of honor at the Institute's events that I did not attend. But that would be the last time that we meet. And um, sadly, uh, I, I did not have that occasion. I did not have the opportunity of meeting him on that occasion. Regardless, this is how I remember Professor Galadima as an intellectual and a distinguished forthright public servant who devoted himself tirelessly to the task of elevating the institution over which he had been given charge and who answered the call of duty right until the moment that he drew his last breath. It was my pleasure to have worked with Professor Deladima and it's my prayer that his family, friends and associates will receive comfort, grace and fortitude to bear this great loss. I also hope that his dreams for the National Institute will come to fruition and that those whose lives he touched will carry on and entrench his legacy. May his memory always be blessed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished guest of honor. Please distinguish ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate the VP's uh, remarks and contributions. We are gradually getting into the main focus of today's event, that is the inaugural lecture. And the first lecture will be coming up shortly. And of course, it's titled, um, it's titled Pro Proliferation of Small Arms and the Steaming Conundrum of Insecurity in Nigeria, Prospects for Control and Sustainable uh, Security. This lecture will be taken by Professor Augustine Ikelegbe, as mentioned earlier, he is of the University of Benin. I will now, at this point, invite Professor Shola Adeyanju MNI, fellow head of Advancement Department in the National Institute, to tell us who the man, Professor Austin Ikelegbe, is. Prof, you are welcome. Thank you. Uh, permit me to uh, skip the protocol so that I can just introduce Professor Ikelegbe. This is a short profile of Professor Augustine Ikelegbe. Professor Ikelegbe teaches comparative politics and public policy at the Department of Political Science of the University of Benin, Benin City.
He obtained a BSc in political science with first class honors from the University of Benin, Benin City in June 1980, and a PhD in political science from the University of Ibadan, Ibadan in February 1988. He has held fellowship positions at the University of Wolverhampton, United Kingdom, 1999 to 2000, and the African Studies Center at the University of Leiden, Netherlands, 2004. He has been adjunct research professor on conflict and peace building, and the Niger Delta studies at the Center for Population and Environmental Department, Benin City, Nigeria, since 2010, and directing staff at the National Institute of Security Studies, Abuja, between November 2014 and October 2017. He was also there December 2018 and November 2019. He is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences University of Benin, Benin City. He has researched, consulted, and published extremely in the areas of governance, violent conflicts, peace building, security, and strategic studies. In addition to, to presenting over 30 papers at public forum and 45 papers at academic conferences, Professor Ikelegwe is also co-author, editor, and co-editor of 14 books, seven monographs, and over 90 book chapters and journal articles in distinguished public publishing outlets. His books on security, among several others, include Militias, Rebels, and Islamist Militants, Human Insecurity and State Crisis in Africa, Pretoria, Institute of Security Studies, edited with Wafula Okumu in 2010. He is also the publisher of Democratic Governance and National Security in Nigeria, Challenges and Opportunities, Institute for Security Studies, which he edited with Muhammad Wali and A. Karim in 2014. He is also the publisher of Trafficking of Small Arms and light weapons in West Africa, routes and illegal arms catches between Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria, Abuja. Professor Ikelegbe also authors The Nigerian Economy and National Security, Challenges and Prospects for Sustainable Security and Development in Abuja, Institute for Security Studies. This he edited with Muhammad Wali and A. Karim in 2015. The, uh, one of the pop, uh, books is also Governance, Sustainable Development, and Peace Building in the Niger Delta, Challenges and Pathways, which was published by Spectrum Books, Ibadan, in 2017. Among several other consultancies and research studies on security issues, Professor Ikelegwe was consultant to Frederick Ebert Stephen, Abuja, and United Nations Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Africa, Lome, Togo, on small arms and light weapons trafficking in West Africa, illicit routes and catches of arms between Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria, 2011 to 2012. Professor Ikelegwe is, was a lead consultant on National Comprehensive Household Survey on Small Arms Experiences of Armed Violence and Perceptions of Security in Nigeria for the Presidential Committee on Small Arms and Light Weapons Control, 2015 to 2016. He was the lead consultant on assessment of ECOWAS counterterrorism strategy and implementation plan for Center for Democracy and Development, Abuja. October to December 2015. And he was a consultant, research on small arms and light weapons, craft production and use in Nigeria for the Foundation for the Institute for International and Development Studies on Small Arms and Survey, Geneva, April to May 2017. 
Professor Ikelegwe is married to a fellow academic, Professor Mrs. Onovuge Ikelegwe of the Department of Geography and Regional Planning, University of Benin, and they are blessed with children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Augustine Ikelegwe to the podium. Thank you. His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellencies, the Governor of Nasarawa State and Governor of Plateau State, the Chief of Defense Staff, ably represented here, and His Majesties that are present, permit me to stand on existing protocol. This lecture, I would say, is difficult to give for me because it brings in huge memories of my association and relationship with Professor Abu Galadima. But what I will say quickly is that a lecture in honor of a fallen colleague, an eminent scholar, consultant, researcher, teacher, and administrator, brings in several perspectives and perceptions. It draws on, for example, the intellectual engagements of the departed colleague, his contributions to scholarship, his scholarly engagements and publications, and attributes the astounding researches that such that the scholar will have done. However, it also presents an opportunity to peep into his major areas of interest, to look at what he has contributed in those major areas of interest. And for me, in my exchanges, interactions, and friendship with him, this was in the area of small arms control and proliferation, control of proliferation of small arms and light weapons. So this is where I key in, into in these uh, lectures. Apart from earlier contacts, our paths crossed in 2015 to 2016, when we were both lead consultants for the Presidential Committee on Small Arms and Life Weapons. I was heading the household survey on small arms and life weapons in Nigeria, and he was handling the survey of early AIDS and civil society, which was located in NIPS. So we interacted extensively and cooperated in the course of that major research. And let me just point out that that is still the most extensive, the most intense study of the phenomenon of proliferation of small arms and light weapons in Nigeria to date. It was a study that covered the entire country. For my own segment of that survey, we, 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 we had over 8,000 respondents, household respondents, across the entire 36 states of the country. But our paths also crossed in the program on leadership and, and uh, leadership development and policy on political parties, which was initially organized you know, by the Nigerian Political Science Association and several international development agencies between 2014, I think, and upwards, which resulted eventually in the establishment of the center in, in NIPS. Again, in this, in this area, we kept on interacting. Yes, as to the theme of this lecture, I can say that we know so much. But because of the time that I have, I'll just put in snipers here and there. I will say, as uh, Oshita and myself did mention in 2019, that never since the Civil War has insecurity become so extensive with, uh, with fear, anxiety, and suspense so high among citizens, and mass killings, destructions, and collateral damages so extensive across the country, amidst sophisticated, organized, and horrendous violence and criminality. Never before has the entire country been held captive 
by terrorists, militants, and armed brigands, as has occurred with the Boko Haram terrorists, armed local and foreign head and militants, and disparate organized bandits, kidnappers, and armed robbery gangs. Never before in our history. And so we are in the throes of a major crisis. And it is important that we examine it. But small arms and light weapons is a major issue in the extensive security crisis, insecurity crisis that we have. Because the proliferation, the prevalence and use of small arms is implicated in all dimensions of criminality and violence. In fact, one of the major drivers of insecurity and violence, the youth segment. To them, arms is a major empowerment. It empowers the youth to, to do diverse things. And it empowers them to be, to be available for diverse uses by the political elite and by all kinds of ethnic group leaders and, and so forth. In this lecture, we try to critically interrogate the crisis of extensive internal security, internal security in Nigeria and how it is connected to pervasive proliferation and prevalence of small arms and light weapons. Usually, we should provide a basis for understanding what we want to say. And again, I want to refer to one of my earlier works where we raised several issues. We said, for example, whether we have adequate understanding interpretation and analysis, and whether we have reached, you know, effective conclusions on the issues that afflict us in this country. Have we gotten the adequate, effective strategies and solutions to manage these situations that confront us? I want to quickly just bring in two perspectives. The first is that as political scientists, we always bring in the state. And the state is a critical actor in the social process and in society. We bring in the state because its character, its nature of constitution, its performance, its capacity determines much of the things that, handle, that happens around us. It determines the state of development. It determines the state of security. It determines the state of progress, material progress that the society achieves. It determines the level of well-being and wellness, the level of human development, human capital development, the level of satisfaction of citizens, the level of connection and commitment of citizens to the state. It is the capacity of the state that determines most of this. And in the case of Africa, our pre pre presentations and most presentations on the African post-colonial states is that it is in crisis, it is weak, it is failing, and in some instances, even collapsing. And these are depicted by the very environment and conditions around us. Even the issue that we are discussing now. The state of insecurity is a manifestation of governance crisis, is a manifestation of state failure, is a manifestation of state weakness. It's a manifestation of poor performance of the state in certain critical areas, such as development such as the management of the youth segment, such as the issues of employment and unemployment, and such as the issue of production in a particular country. So these things are manifest around us, depicting that there is a problem with the state. But some other people have tried to come in with other conceptions. Some have said, okay, the post-colonial state in Africa is disruptive. It's disruptive because of its kind of behavior in relation to citizens and in relation to components of the state and society. Last year, as scholars, we think and reflect continuously over how we can understand the situations in this country and across other countries in Africa. And one of the perspectives that has come up is the issue of the ruptured state. And the concept looks at the relationship between state and citizens relationship between state and peoples, and component groups, and identity groups. What is the nature of that relationship? And how is it affected by the performance of the state? What we find in many parts of Nigeria is that there is a growing rupture, a growing disconnection 
a growing loss of connect, a growing loss of compact between the citizens and the state. This is manifested. We see it every time around us. Many of our young people don't want to stay in this country again. They are disenchanted, they are frustrated, they are alienated. And they have lost it. And most of them want to do anything. I will know the thousands that may have died in the Sahara Desert, physically trying to cross. And up to today, I will tell you, most children of the elite are applying for one thing or the other, to go to Canada, one scholarship, you know. All these are manifestations of and so our citizens are exiting into the illegal domain that you're exiting into all kinds of criminality and all kinds, you call, so many things are happening around us. The phenomenon of Yahoo Plus, you know, the phenomenon of scammers, all these are manifestations of the consequences of state rupture, of the growing distance, at the growing space between citizens and the state. Well, that is what uh, where I don't have much time to explain this concept, which I started putting across last year. However, let us look at the issue that we have come to talk about here. And the first thing is that the issue of proliferation. There is agreement among scholars that there is an increasing scale of proliferation and arms prevalence in Nigeria. Scholars are agreed. Where they are not agreed is the scale, the magnitude, and the estimates and I can tell you that there have, been many, there have been many estimates. At a point, it was estimated that about 70% of the total arms that were in West Africa, which amounted to about 8 million, were in Nigeria. At a point, it was estimated that about 1.5 million arms by different organizations, like the ANSA, were in, in Nigeria. But there have been some studies rather that, that went beyond just estimating. In a study that I did between 2012, I was published in 2014, one of the books that was mentioned. I, I did came, come to the conclusion that the prevalence had increased from about 1.5 to 3 million. And I gave reasons why that, has ha that happened. The proliferation and increasing profile of non-state armed groups, for example. The in increases in violent conflicts and community conflicts. I gave a lot of reasons why that had happened. So we were estimating that illegal arms in civilian hands was between three and six million. I did mention that the small arms survey, small arms and light weapons survey, which was conducted by the Presidential Committee on Small Arms and Light Weapons, is the most extensive so far. And part of that project was located here in NIPS. And that study had come up with some estimates. There's an interim report, and I want to just give some, some estimates. The study found out that Firearms, number of firearms in Nigeria households was about 14%. And the average number of firearms in arms bearing households was 1.24. The number of firearms per 100 persons was found to be 17. Using the 2006 population, this survey came out with an estimate of 5.4 million arms in civilian arms in Nigeria. But then, Using the, the projections of population from 2006 to 2016, the survey came out with an approximation of 6.4, or between 6.4 to 6.5 firearms in civilian arms hands, most of which are long barrel guns and handguns. And so, let us go on from there. There are some details about these these, these uh, estimates that I will give much later if I have the time. But let me tell us that the prevalence and use of small arms and light weapons is now very extensive in Nigeria. There is an ownership structure. I will talk about the changing patterns later of the ownership stru structure and the prevalence in communities, in households, among the elite, among the youth. There's a, there's a pattern of prevalence among these groups. But let me talk about the changing patterns so that I'll bring out the very important region, across regions. We found out that the southeast and south-south used to be the high points of small arms smuggling and sales, arms markets and availability. This is changing because of the rising profiles of demand and use of small arms in the northeast, north central, and even the northwest. Previously, the southwest and northwest regions 
had very low levels of proliferation. Again, that is changing because the Northwest is now home to so much banditry and communities are organizing against banditry. That is fueling an arms race. Again, in the Southwest, that has begun to change with the, header, uh, with the crisis between headers and farmers and communities and the mobilization by communities and even ethnic white groups to counter, you know, that, that uh, pattern, that what is emerging. Cross, the pattern of cross-border cross -border proliferation is also, is also changing. Be initially, it was large supplies from the maritime areas and the coast, and then from the southwest borders, which was very busy, and the ports. It changed because large-scale inflows emerged from the collapse of state armories in Libya and the emergence of so many terrorist groups in the Sahelian West Africa, which have increased the demand and supply of arms. In fact, it is reported that there have been large scale inflows even through trucks, you know, transporting arms from the Libya end through Niger into Mali and sometimes into, into, into Nigeria. That again has changed. Again, there's a shift in ownership. Before, it used to be ownership for personal security. Now it is changing from ownership to collect for collective security. That is becoming the emphasis now. We see that with the proliferation of vigilante groups. And we see that with the emergence of communities that are arming themselves. So it's arms for collective security. That is the emerging pattern. Initially, arms prevalence was more among the elite who owned pistols, pump action guns, and a few, I mean, uh, currently, I mean, not some had uh, what you call the AK-47, the popular weapon of choice among the militias, bandits, and co. But that, again, has changed because there's now large-scale weapons availability and use among large-scale armed groups and bandits. So the pattern is changing. Again, we can talk of changing patterns, changing patterns in the drivers of insecurity and even arms proliferation in Nigeria. Now, and I, I'm sure you, uh, you have realized that as an incisive and perceptive Nigerian, that there's a regime of aggression, lawlessness, impunity, and machoism, if I nihilism, among the youth, among our youth. It is manifested in their use of violence, in the abuse of violence, in the abuse of small arms and life weapons, in the abuse of drugs. This is evident. You hear them, listen to the youths. You hear that, you, hear that, you know that they have developed a, a nihilist language, lexicon, language. Instead of saying kill, they will say delete. They say, you know, they have their own concepts. They will say waste. So, you know, and when they use some, such concepts, the emotional component is gone. Because instead of saying brutalize, you know, they will say meme. Listen to the youths. They have a language. And that, that language depicts the, the, the rebellion. It depicts their resistance to society. It depicts their, it depicts their attitude to the state and to fellow, and to fellow citizens. Again, poverty, on the, or extensive unemployment, underemployment, relative deprivation, growing in the social inequalities, is fueling frustration and alienation among the youth. And they are reacting. And one way by which they are, they are reacting is to seek empowerment, is more arms and life weapons, and it being used by gangs, bands, militias, bandits, and such like. So, drug abuse is the latest. It has become a major problem. And it's a driver of small arms proliferation. If you, again, if you listen to the youth and listen to information around them, the drug abuse is not so extensive that the ones that are rich are depending, or who come from rich families because they are largely youth, they depend on cocaine and such like. The ones that are poor, they, de they depend on all kinds of derivatives and mixtures. You'll be surprised the kind of mixtures and derivatives some, you, you know, I don't, I don't want to tell you some of those things, but these are things when you begin to interact through research and such like with the youth, you will get to know them. 
Even who will know that the whatever descriptor of lizards can be used as drugs? Or that what comes out from the pit latrines can be used as drugs? In fact, at a point I got to know that when you see young people carrying a bottle of Coke, something that looks like a bottle of Coke, you see them carrying it for some time. If it's not Coke, it is these mistress that they are carrying. That's to tell you the kind of youth we have today and why this is, you know, attracting, you know, uh, the use of small. Then illegal mining has become, miners are empowering, you know, arming bandits and gangs to protect their territories, to protect, you know, their mining. And so that, again, is a major driver of insecurity. But the largest driver, which the small arms survey did point out, is the insecurity, extensive insecurity. Most people are acquiring arms because of the, the need to safeguard and protect themselves. So what do I mean by steaming conundrum of insecurity? By that, I refer to the boiling and burning, but foggy, stifling, and oppressive state of insecurity that has raised deep and extensive concerns, anxiety, tensions, and fears in the country. The national security situation is now a conundrum, extremely confusing, but frequently erupting in threats, casualties, and disruptions, and has thus been difficult to conceptualize, understand, and explain. Diverse rumors everywhere. All kinds of information come out. But the important thing is that there is so much fear and anxiety in the land. There are pictures, we all know those pictures and narratives that have been coming out from the security situations in the country. How people are shot on the roads, how they are shot in their farms, people are not killed. Again, we uh, explain some of these things. That, but it's not just the fear of insecurity, but the consequences. Even the state reactions generate consequences for citizens. When they ban the bikes, when they ban keke napeb, it affects the citizens. When there are stray bullets in the fight between the security agencies and the people and criminals, the roads are blocked. The citizens are affected daily, both by criminals and the counter state measures against criminals. But more importantly, let us look at some of the re reports that came out from the survey. One, a quarter of the survey respondents felt that they were likely to experience or be targets of violent attacks. Why nearly a quarter? felt that it was unsafe to walk in their local areas or neighborhoods after dark. This depicts the situation of insecurity. About one in eight persons in this study states, or in all these states, know someone or they have experienced violence themselves. In fact, because of time, I will just read out the estimates. The study found out that about eight million persons who have experienced violence or known persons that have experienced violence in the, in the year between 2015 and 2016. Again, the nature of insecurity, as found out by the survey, also shows that the state of insecurity is depicted in the public concerns. There are public concerns. You know, normally people are concerned about health, concerned about their private economies or local economies, but we found out that the survey found out, don't mind me because I was a lead consultant there, the survey found out that among the concerns of Nigerians, the insecurity Safety, threat to life, threat of violence was number three across the board. In some instances, it was even higher on the scale. Now, there was also, the story also found out that there were several drivers of these concerns, headers, all kinds of robber, rob, robberies and all that. But let me also mention quickly that there are changing patterns, in, even in this security in Nigeria. If you study it critically, you will find that there are patterns and trends. And let me just identify a few of them. One, armed robbery, which was the terror of yesterday, has become old modern and too risky. And what is now, is, is now second rate. It has been taken over by kidnapping, which is a higher yield criminal venture, which has which, you know, can bring so much money. Criminality has acquired larger network. It's no more a few people carrying out. It's now a large scale network. Even the kidnappers, they have those who take care of the banking, the housekeeping, the negotiations, the technical aspects, you know, and the operations. So you see that there are not large networks. We also find that criminality has become more brutal. It seems as if there is a stranger or foreign component among those perpetrating these atrocities, atrocities in Nigeria. And that segment 
is more brutal, more brutal and more horrendous in the violence that they perpetrate. Now, it's not difficult to see arms displaying youths up and down, you know, people carrying arms. That is one of the new tendencies. The magnitude of operations of criminals has increased extensively. So bandits now go to communities and abduct 60 persons, 50 persons, and all kinds. We know recently, and in fact from the Chibok period, they, they now go to schools. They have been going to schools and abducting hundreds. Victimhood to insecurity has also enlarged. It has enlarged because a lot of people are killed in large numbers. They suffer destructions. The victimhood is now expansive. And bands have become more large scale. They now have camps, kidnapper dens in the forest, you know, ritualist dens, all kinds in the forest. And it seems as if local criminals have been crowded out. Local criminals have been crowded by a larger crowd of organized, of organized, uh, more violent and atrocious and more sophisticated armed bands and criminals. The local criminals, the petty criminals, they have been crowded out. Nigeria's forest reserves, forests and all that, all have become real or government spaces in terms of government presence and government reach. And they are now the terrain and territories, territorial spaces of criminals, bandits and headsmen, criminal headsmen. You will know that banditry has taken over in so many areas. Crime has now become a very lucrative business. The headers used to be a little more peaceful, but it seems they have been overwhelmed by more criminally bent you know, segments who may not own house, car cows, but are probably, probably of the same ethnic component. However, there are many problems. What is driving insecurity? What is driving proliferation? Again, the paper is, will be available and we might be able to, to look at them when we, we, see, we see. But something we can point out quickly because of time. The leadership and management as well as the structure and deployments of the LEAs seem to be poor, thus undermining performance and the motivation and morale of personnel. Policies are tended to intrude in recruitment, posting and promotions, and thus the quality of personnel and performance in deployments has been undermined. The nature of LEAs' response to crimes is also a problem. I don't have time to go through much of this. But these things are affecting us in many ways. Economic decline, you know, in terms of agricultural production, in terms of investments, business, and such like, is affecting us. Farmers are abandoning their farms. Armed violence perpetrated by headers also, also are all in all, all parts of the country. People can't travel by road again. When you get to the airport, you have a false and elusive picture of Nigeria's prosperity. But it's not that, that there are prosperous that are flying. They are flying because it is not safe to travel by the road. There's a sense of siege and extensive threats and perceptions of orchestrated, preplanned, and organized attacks on the security, socioeconomic development, and well being of some groups. And they are beginning to react by, by, by organizing collective security, particularly through regional vigilantes and such like. What are the prospects for controlling small arms? I think we should go for a national action plan for small arms and light weapons control much beyond what has been happening, which has been ad, ad hoc. You know, uh, sometimes when the, the situation is risky or when it's more extensive, government announces some things. I think we have to go beyond that. The, all the LEAs have to have arms that address these things. You have to provide the entry points, the proliferation routes and all that so that they can be contained. There's need for a massive, you know, small arms uh, uh, program. And secondly, there's need for extensive general civilian disarmament. It's not saying that you should do disarmament in one section or one part, but it must be associated with credibility, integrity, confidence, and trust in the government. It will also be associated by some major efforts to control security so that people can have a sense, a, a, I mean, a sense of less threat around. From the survey, we found out that people are ready to surrender their arms if there's safety, if, there, if there's less threat from small arms and violent uh, actors. If there's less, they are ready to surrender their arms. But that environment has to be created so that, and then the, the, such a, a civilian disarmament must be associated with propaganda, mobilization, you know? So it's not just announcing that or directing that you should surrender. No, mobilize the people. Take time. 
true propaganda as such like there's no need for this. And in fact, one thing comes out clear. Many Nigerians don't want to own arms, not because it is too difficult, but because of moral, morality issues, the issues of keeping the arms. But because of persisting threats, they are, they are, they are, talking, they are, they are buying arms and keeping them. We need to effectively manage security. We need to also arm, you know, equip our law enforcement agencies. We need state reforms. We need state reforms. First of all, this is in several areas. Restructuring has been on the agenda of public discourses and conversations for so long. But no, you know, not much is being done. But the truth is that until we restructure performance in the economy, in governance, in security, in many areas, the truth is that it must de decentralize. Long ago, a, a classic book was published, and uh, it was called The Failure of the Centralized State. The centralized state failed the world many years ago. But we are still deploying the centralized state in Nigeria. It is time to decentralize, you know, Nigeria. And then we talk about good governance. But it's mo mostly, you know, it's like public talk. Effort is, is not, it's really poor. We have to gain our citizens back. Our citizens are not distant from the government. They are distant from the state. We have to gain them back. If we don't gain them back and the current situations continue, there will be more challenge of implosion. The NSAS may be a small thing when it finally implodes because there's so much inequality, there's so much poverty, there's so much deprivation. And these things we tell, you know how the hoodlums keyed into the NSAS, NSAS movement. The state has to redeem itself. The Nigerian state must redeem itself. It must redeem itself from elite bias and double loyalties, from eruptory statehood, from institutional weaknesses. It must redeem itself from exclusive development rather than inclusive development. It must redeem itself from neglect of the youth to mobilization of the youth for development. We can't continue. It has to redeem itself from huge governance costs in terms of political administration to cost for material development and improvement of citizen lives. But more importantly, I think we need a national peace architecture. Uh, fortunately, myself and Professor uh, Samwegu, we worked on this. That was about 2015, 2015. And, you know, it was because we, we recommended, and if I, we tried to prefer the document that was earlier. And one of the things was the national peace architecture, comprising of national peace councils, councils state peace councils, local government peace councils, that we, that we have members that, are, that have integrity, that are respected, that are competent, and because they will have the confidence of the citizens, they will be able to manage the violent conflicts that are all around us. So let me make a conclusion, and I would like to read it, because it's important. Nigeria is in a vicious cycle. Insecurity is, driving, is, is driven by small arms proliferation. The latter can only be contained by effective security and security provision. Can we get that to, con to control small arms? Small arms availability fuels criminality and violence, which further drives small arms demand and supply. Uncertainty and tensions emanating from pervasive and security threats is driving a competition for arms accumulation. The state of insecurity has exposed the underbelly of the Nigerian state, particularly its weakness, its weak penetration and occupation of territory, its weak regulation and control of borders, of transhumans, of migration, of illicit trading, of drug use, and small arms, and light weapons proliferation and prevalence. The nature of manifestation of current security threats is widening fault lines along ethnic, regional, and religious lines, creating fear and driving further the broad agitations for restructuring and state reforms and the potential threats of secession and disintegration. In fact, the greatest threat to Nigeria's corporate existence today is perhaps the nature of internal security threat in which a segment of an ethnic group is broadly implicated and to which the state is alleged to be comp complacent and even effectively responding, thus spawning all kinds of conspiracy theories and diverse narratives and interpretations that delegitimize the federal government and threaten national integration and unity. Insecurity has become the new metaphor, the metaphor for state failure and governance deficits in Nigeria. 
It is now the new juncture of conversations and discourses around state reforms and the future of Nigeria. If not effectively contained and managed, the Nigerian state may collapse under the weight of intractable insecurity and small arms proliferation. The fear of collapse is not illusory. Let's not think that it is illusory. As indicated by the extremely divisive narratives, the ethnicization of criminality, and of counter-state responses to security threats, the emerging labeling of some groups, the identity solidarity that is pitching some groups against, against others, and the emergent accentuation of ethnic and regional self-determination and self-defense mechanisms. However, proliferation and prevalence of small arms and insecurity can be contained, and the framework and processes for sustainable security can be constructed. Pertaining to the latter, we highlight the issue of state reforms, management of the underlying drivers of insecurity, reform of the state security sector, effective management of security, and then the development of a national peace architecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, while the presentation was going on, I just recalled what uh, Professor Ikelebit said, that it was a tough one for him because he brought back memories. It also brought back memories for us at the National Institute because uh, uh, Mr. Sagwa, my humble self, and many other NIP staff were part of that um, research when it was being carried out here. We'd like to thank uh, Professor Kelegwe for the passion and intellectual verve he brought to bear in this presentation. Can we please give him another round of applause? <laughs> Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, James Baron Hope that stated that it's after death that we measure men. And it is therefore my honor and privilege to invite the man who is going to take the citation on the second guest lecturer, who is going to be speaking on Abu Galadima, the scholar, the strategist, and administrator. He is no other person than a senior fellow in the Directorate of Research and Chief Operating Officer of the Political Parties Leadership and Policy Development Center here at the National Institute. He is in the person of Dr. Musa. Umar. Please give him a round of applause. Okay. Oh, we are here. <laughs> Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, just some few words in regard to the second distinguished lecturer this afternoon, Professor Sam Egu, born on February the 7th, 1960, at Dekina local government in Kogi State. He attended the famous Ahmad Bello University, Zaria, where he did his uh, basic studies, as well as obtained BSc Political Science in 1982. And he was the best graduating student in that year. He also obtained his master's and PhD in political economy and development, all from the University of Jos. His PhD was in 2003. And he joined the Department of Political Science, University of Jos, in April 1986, and rose to the position of a professor in October 2003. He was the former president, Nigeria Political Science Association, from 2008 to 2011. He was also governance advisor to United Nations Development Program, Nigeria Country Office, from 2009 to 2014. Presently, he is the resident electoral commissioner, INEC, uh, in charge of Niger State. Your Excellency, please permit me to invite Professor Samiogu to the podium. It is now good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> both for 
the economy of time and the need not to repeat what people have said, I will try to be very brief. I think at this point of the program, it is very clear to us that um, we are actually here to celebrate a scholar, a strategist, and an administrator. It came out clearly from the presentation of the acting DG. It came out presently, I mean, clearly from Gambo's recollection of who Galadima is, and also from the vice president. So I'm not going to say anything fundamentally new. But since I have been allocated a space, I think I need to say something, probably something that has not been emphasized. Well, I think I, I am eminently qualified to speak about the late Professor Habu Galadima because he has been my colleague for 30 years. And I never really referred to Habu as a colleague. He was like a brother to me. It is something I shared with Professor Kelewe. I come from the Kina local government in Kogi, and three quarter of the Kina local government is actually inhabited by Igbera people. So on my maternal side, four generations ago, they were all Igbera. But today they are Igala, and they are forgotten their Igbera ethnicity. So, <laughs> So again, I raise this issue. Uh, Professor Ibrahim Shaibi is here. You know, I raise this issue again on Wednesday when I came here about how intermingled we are. And yet, elite narratives is about how different we are. We are actually the same people. So Habu was like my brother, and I treated him as a brother. And I want to say something. And Pam Shah is here. There was a time. In the, in the early 2000s, the Department of Political Science, University of Joss, was divided. And there were three people on one side against 18. Abu happened to be on the side of the minority. But, even as loyal as he was to his position, he never spoke out of proportion to anybody. And his language was language of moderation. I mean, this is somebody that I cherish as an individual. Now, let me go to the point where I knew Abu. Abu graduated from the Department of Political Science in 1987. I joined the department in 1986. That was a year before Abu graduated. So I knew him first as a student and much later as a colleague. And something instructive about the University of Joss and the Department of Political Science at this point is that the late 80s and the early 90s, during which Abu graduated and got recruited into the department represented the golden age of that department. So that speaks a lot about the quality of training and the judgment that went into recruiting Abu as an assistant lecturer in 1990. In the Department of Political Science at that time, I can recall very vividly, you had Professor Isawa Elaiwu, you have Professor Shaibu Ibrahim, who is sitting here. You have the late Professor Aaron T. Ghana. You had Takaya. You had Paul Logams. And you can go on and on. And our department represented the best of the social sciences at that time. So Abu got training in that environment and probably was one of the luckiest people. But that is not all. I knew Abu at the beginning from a distance, and I can tell you that even at that distance, he had a very unique personal courage. In fact, my first judgment of Abu is that this is somebody who is from a middle class background, 
all like people who came from peasant background like myself and Gambo, you know. And I won't go into that detail. And you could see that personal courage all through. Abu was very conscious of himself in the way he walked and in the way he talked, you know. And I think he had already confirmed his class destiny even as early as at the time I met him. May he so rest in peace. Now, I want to talk about Abu and I want to go back to my last encounter with Abu in December. The first encounter took place on the 15th of December, on Tuesday. I came for the program that NIPS had organized. And as soon as I met Abu, I called him. I said, Abu, you are under pressure. You are not looking nice. Please cut down on your work rates. And I knew what they were doing two weeks before that engagement. And then on the second day, that was Wednesday, I saw him again. And I, I pulled him aside. I said, Abu, I am not happy seeing you here. You must not be present in all NIPS events. Abu, if you die, there will be a replacement for you. Please. And that was my last encounter with Abu. So on Sunday morning, I was in my house and I got a call from Abu's cousin, who is my staff in the stores department. He had never called me, although he had my number. So when I saw his call, I said, why would Galadima call me on a Sunday? You know, and what he put on the table was very bad. Abu had died. You know, so it's a disaster that we have tried to live with. You know, and the reality of death is that it is not rumors. When they say somebody is dead, he's dead. You won't see him again. And for those of us who have faith, there's still another point of meeting. And that is what we need to take along with us. The third thing I want to speak about, Habu, is about his apprenticeship, his scholarship, his networking, and his rise to stardom. You know, if you are a good craftsman, it is because you are a good apprentice. So all the attributes of Abu that have been mentioned today and celebrated are attributes that came from the fact that he was a very good apprentice. And if you are an apprentice, it means you have a master or you have masters. Abu had very good masters, very early. Professor Jonah Isawa Elaigu, Gambo mentioned how he followed him to the Institute for Intergovernmental Relations, or the center in Abuja. Abu chose Elaigu as his role model, and also chose the late Professor Ali Mazrui. Anybody who knew these two, or who know these two people, will know that one attribute they share is that they have the greatest facility with the English language. Mazrui spoke in terms that you cannot mistake. Elaigu is reputed for coining words. And as a student, I remember many of them. One of them is about Nigeria's first republic, in which the regional tail was wagging the federal dog. You can go on and on. And Abu followed these people very carefully. And he spoke their language with the same level of clarity. And I think for him to be a good craftsman, you must return to his apprenticeship. Abu was a very good, dedicated apprentice, and that radiated very clearly in all that he did. In fact, you can see that in three main, three main domains of academic or intellectual uh, legacy that Abu left behind. And uh, of course, the first one is on federalism. In fact, uh, if you are following a LIGO and you are not a good scholar of federalism, then you have lost all your time. And uh, the last moment I spoke with Abu on federalism, Abu kept emphasizing the principle of subsidiarity. 
as a key element of the federal principle that this country has not been able to imbibe. And he kept on saying that to refederalize, you need to return to that basic principle. And I'm happy that before Abu died, he had published an article in Publius, one of the most remarkable journals on federalism. Um, it's a major you know, legacy for Abu. The second area that Abu left his footprint in terms of intellectual practice is on the issues of human rights and human security. And I think the whole notion of human security takes me back to the last issues raised by Professor Ikelegbe about the missing link in our development. The fact that we have so much focused on state conception of security, about arming the states, about procuring the most sophisticated weapon for the states without thinking of doing development. A development that is not just about growth, but one that is inclusive and takes on board the most marginalized sections of the population. And so from his general work on issues of peace and security, Abu insisted that the question of, of human security was very, very key. I don't want to talk about his movement to, you know, to Bellagio or what he did while at Bradford, but I want you to understand that the person we are here to celebrate today was really a true globalist, but who uses knowledge to improve the local environment. I see this very clearly in the work that I did very closely with Habu, and I'll just mention a few of them and I'll shut up. In 2013, I was governance advisor to UNDP. And we were putting together the program to support Nigeria's electoral process. And as you know, one of the most difficult areas of engaging electoral democracy is on political parties. In the world of donors and de development partners, they are very, very sensitive about engaging with political parties because political parties are political in nature. And so we were looking for a platform where we can open you know, a space for policymakers to have dialogue with political party leaders and build and nurture them because the weakness of our democracy today is exactly the weakness of political parties. So those who have said that if you want to measure the health of a democracy, look at the health of political parties, they are right. And so we had an eternal conversation in the UN with the donors supporting the electoral uh, process in Nigeria. And I happened to be the manager of that project. And I said that we are going to NIPS to establish the political party um, leadership and development center. Um, and they said, Who, where is NIPS? Where is it located? I said, well, that is Nigeria's leading institute in terms of engaging you know, important people who form the cream of the ruling elite. Is the correct venue to go. It, has, it enjoys national visibility and it is neutral. And they said, well, they will try. And that is how we came to NIPS. Professor Habu Galadima happened to be the first chief operating officer of the political party center. In other words, he nurtured that center from the scratch. You know, I'm happy that as I'm talking today that much later in the life of development partners, they decided to directly give money to NIPS to engage political parties. That was based on confidence that during the time Professor Habu was the chief operating officer, he brought that center to a point that it can be trusted even by development partners. And I think this is a very important tribute to Habu Galadima. 
So if you are looking at the curriculum that has been developed, if you are looking at the engagement with IPAC, which is the Interparty Advisory Council, and if you look at the review of the entire curriculum, which was done, even when Abu had transited from being the Chief Operating Officer to the Director General, you, can con you, ca you are convinced that Abu was one who, has, who had his eyes on the big picture. He had his eye on the big picture. And I don't want to dwell so much on this, but Abu was also an institution builder. And I'll be very brief here. You know, one of the things that he has done, which strikes me deeply, is that Abu went for the best. And he wanted to bring the best to the institute. Not many of us do this. Many of us are very territorial. Many of us don't want to bring people that will outshine us. Abu looked for the best. It was the late Professor Claude Ake who said that only the deep can cut the deep. If you are not deep, you can't cut the deep. As I'm standing here, I can see Professor Tunji Olaopa. When I heard he was here, I was very happy. And I said, yes. And I told Abu, I said, once you have established in your head that you are bringing the best here to reposition the institute, you are going to write yourself into history. And that is the history we are celebrating today. <laughs> it was on Wednesday that I realized that Dr. I mean, Professor Sunday or Church has also joined the institute. It is still in the same direction of bringing the best. So Abu thought of the future. He didn't think of the immediate. He didn't think about himself. And I'm happy that, yes, God destined him to be the DG of this institute, but God also destined him not to last on this post. And it is to God that we have to thank for everything that has happened. I'll round up very quickly by saying, Abu has certain things that you can't ignore. He had humility and level-headedness. You can't find Abu with arrogance. And he was really, in terms of what he did, you didn't find him showing off. And yet, he was somebody who I think lived in moderate comfort. Abu had sense of moderation. He had sense of moderation. He had commitment to excellence. And in many, for my generation, Abu is one person whose level of morality was very high. I knew this very well. In, in, he was in pedestrian. He was somebody you could associate with very high level of, mo of morality. And therefore, a moral compass for so many who were very close to him. And I think Abu kept fidelity with his friends. In fact, Gambo is a good testimony. They had been together. I had always seen them. You know, where they were not together, it was because it was necessary to separate. And uh, as I was coming to give this lecture, or to give this speech, my mind went back to the funeral oration that Engels read at the graveside of Marx. Marx died on the 14th of March, 1883. And three days later, his friend Engels came to his graveside to read what has now become his funeral oration. In the last sentence of that funeral oration, Engels said of Marx, his name will endure through the ages, and so will his work. I think this will be the same for Abu Galadima. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sam Ego. He has exposed a lot of things about uh, our late DG. He said our late DG was an apprentice. That means he gave room for him to be tutored. He learned. He allowed himself to be taught. 
a human rights activist, maybe in a subtle way, and of course, a global figure who impacted this environment with his wealth of experience. As solemn as this assembly may be, may I request that we celebrate the late DG, Professor Abu Galadini. As we move on, we are getting to the point of taking the tribute. But before we do that, may I kindly request the pleasure of the Director of Research in the person of Professor Doom Pansha to perform an activity. Prof, you are welcome. Um, His Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Shibanjo, S-A-N-G-C-O-N, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, before I uh, perform what I've been asked to do, let me just make um, two remarks. Um, in the Department of Political Science, University of Jos, where Sam Egu and quite a number of us were either students or taught. Um, Habu, you know his name is HS. And based on what Sam Egu said, we converted the HS to high standard. Habu, like Sam said, wanted to be just unique in everything that he did. In his dressing, in the way he talked, um, his discussions in class, the pedagogy he adopted, the examples that he gave in class were way, way up there, including the kind of car that he drove. <laughs> so that was Abu for us. And um, I remember in the department, we called him the Ankunama of Toto. Uh, those of you who know Hausa, you know what Kunama means. Um, he was a striking force, and so his delivery of, of whatever he wanted to do was very quite striking. And one of us just said, I want an Ankunama of Toto. And that was Habu for us. I think the policy, strategy, and the leadership community would greatly miss him. And those of you who, have list, who, who listened to him, he is fond of using the, um, the Chinese war author, the well-known one, Sun Si. Yeah, those of us who have listened to him who certainly missed him. Um, let me just say something about the last few days. Um, we were... I think on the eve of the graduation, we were invited by a stakeholder of the National Institute uh, for a late night meeting. That meeting was very stormy. And something happened. Um, in, the, in the discussion, um, he was being accused of something that he, for us didn't happen. And I'm using this to say that Habu, as if he knew that he was going to leave very soon, and he made peace you know, with all those he thought would require that peace. In that stormy meeting, Habu told the stakeholders that he's sorry for everything that had happened. Even when, of us, when most of us thought that there was no need for him to apologize for anything because we didn't see anything that he had done. But he said he was sorry. And for me, that went deep, you know, to telling who Habu was. He made peace before he left. The cap I'm wearing was given to me by Habu. And um, he promised that he was going to give me the other one that is usually worn here. The, the Zeni Goku me Akikira. And up to, the, to his um, demise, that was not delivered. Uh, Professor Shaibu, I don't know where to get it. So you have to give me one um, so that I would keep remem um, 
remind, I mean, remembering my friend. On behalf of the committee of friends that have put this together, and, and as a matter of fact, Sam Ugu made the point that Habu was a pan-Africanist, was a pan, I mean, he was pan-Nigerian, meaning that he had friends across geographies, friends across ethnicities, religion, races. I, I can tell you this, that um, about five minutes after his death, I got a call from South Africa, and they were asking me. I got calls from Nairobi. I got calls from everywhere, asking whether that's, uh, what had happened was actually true. Had friends across genders, had friends across crisis, I mean uh, classes. Now this, we're putting this together to um, tell you know, his family and our group of friends that we've not forgotten, that we will not you know, for, uh, forget um, Habu Galadima. Um, the president of the Zang Old Boys All Students Association is here. Um, Mr. Musa Baku, where are you, sir? Oh, okay. Thank you so very much, sir, for coming. So the, um, what you see on the, the screen is an initiative that is based on conversations among friends and colleagues of late Professor Galadima. The purpose is to raise funds to support the education and health care of his family, his wife, three daughters named Farida, uh, Camila, and Mariam. We are therefore requesting you to generously contribute to, his laudable, to this laudable initiative in any way you can. A bank account has been opened for this purpose uh, with his wife and first daughter as signatories. Um, you can see on the screen that the, the bank um, to be dealt with is Polaris, and the account number is there indicated, and the name of the account is also indicated. We want to thank you very much for your anticipated cooperation and donation to this account for the purpose that I have mentioned. May his soul and the souls of the faithful departed rest in peace with the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Can we please appreciate the Director of Research with another round of applause? Thank you very much, sir. In the words of the great American playwright and novelist, Taunton Wilder, and I quote, the highest form of tribute to the dead is not grief, but gratitude. To take the tributes, to start the tributes, is the Andoma of Doma, His Royal Highness, Ahmed Aliu Onao, C-O-N. His Royal Highness, sir, for your tribute, sir. Okay. Mr. Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Acting DG NIPS, Your Excellencies representing the two governors of Plato and Nasara states, permit me to stand by the protocol established. Uh, DG, I thank you for the invitation to join this moment of the discussion about my dear friend the uh, South East uh, Institute while he lived, at least at the passing phase of his life, Professor Abu Galadima. Uh, 
uh, it's an emotional opportunity while professor Egu, who met us at our graduating phase in the university of Jos, while abu was reading political science or reading sociology i was talking about the academic life of abu Galadima. some of us had the exclusive preserve of his life on stage of the classroom. When HS was qualified as high standard, I thought some of us know that best because some of us had an idea of the exact kind of clothes he would prefer to wear, the length of his trousers, the color of the clothes he must wear. And the way everybody around him must behave. That's why several times we called him severally. Mr. P. That means Mr. Personality. He has never compromised anything that matters to his image. He has always sounded that nothing should be done to undermine his personality. Relatedly in Hausa, we call him Barazana just to insist that certain things are beneath what must be done around him or that has to do with him. And relatedly, all his friends must be at the same disposition. Let me acknowledge our mother, Miri Galadima. Uh, we have eaten from her pot several with Abu Galadima. Um, in a long time, I've not seen Professor Ibrahim in so several years since I graduated from the university. Professor Gambo met us, but we were a senior in the university. Professor Galadima and I were a senior. But we ended up as friends because of the nature of humility of who Abu Galadima is. And once you are intellectually very sound, you are naturally a Bugalajima's friend. He will befriend you whether you like it or not. He must explore why you are so intelligent. And if you are better than him, he must make sure he matches you or he outshines you. And that's what made the difference between me and him. As twins, he took the intellectual, I took the height. <laughs> but you can't take it away from him that Abu Ghalajima will be greatly missed by some of us. For so several reasons. When Abu had the opportunity to join NIPS, he called Your Highness, I have two options. One, I'll go to sabbatical in a university. The other one is to join NIPS in the category he started with here. Your Highness, I'm at a, I'm at a crossroad. I said, well, my brother, NIPS gives you an, an opportunity for challenges, exposure, and giving you disposition to studies, and trying your best to make sure nobody does better than you. You will meet people with capacity in NIPS, both within the intellectual world and the national service. It affords an opportunity for you to exemplify yourself and add to your wealth of knowledge. And certainly, you won't find that in a university, regular university. So go to NIPS. We won't know the opportunity we'll bring up tomorrow. When he decided to come to NIPS, he said, well, I've used your, decision, I've used your advice. I hope it works out. So the day he became the DG, if I'm not the first, I'm among the first three. He said, well, I thank you for your advice and I congratulate you that today I've ended up the DG of NIPS. <clears throat> no doubt, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, those of you that worked closely with him in his sojourn in this place, have a better knowledge of what manner of contributions Abu Ghalajima were left behind in the science of time. 
in this hallowed institute, the one and only of its kind in Nigeria, where policymakers are groomed, nurtured, impacted on, and are looked up to by the nation to forge a direction for the future and survival of our dear country, Nigeria. And that's why I remember with a very heavy heart at the course of one of our last discussions with him. Since whenever we meet, those of us that do not have the kind of intellectual prowess Abu was gifted with, we try to steal something from the exposure he has had. I say, Prof, why is it that he's the ordinary Nigerian that kills his brother across the country? In whatever form of violence and destruction you find in this country, is the ordinary Nigerian that kills his brother. If an Igbo man kills a Hausa man, is a poor Hausa man that is killed by a poor Igbo man. If a Hausa man kills a Yoruba man, is a poor Hausa man that kills a poor Yoruba man. If a Yoruba man attacks any person from the north, in the south, is a poor Yoruba man that kills the poor Hausa man. And all of us are common victims of the maladministration of this nation by those of us that are privileged to formulate policies and govern the country. What can Nibs begin to think about? To fashion an opportunity of enlightenment and national rescue so that the ordinary poor man that is a victim of maladministration and wrong policies and wrong manners of implementation of policies and implement, implementers of policies so that we are not victims on all fronts, both from the size of policy makers and implementers, and on the side of our ignorance of venting anger of our common lack against ourselves. Can you begin to think about it? I say, as a layman, this is my thinking. But can Nips package a thought that will begin to enlighten Nigerians? Because once you rescue that aspect of aggression, the country is already saved. Once the ordinary man begins to identify and know from which platform his circumstance of lack, desperation, and hopelessness originates from, then we'll begin, even in the practice of politics, to act appropriately by deciding on the right manner of people that must represent us so that their policies impact positively in our well being. So I said, This is my thought as a non academic, a man in the village, no more exposed to other than the cries and the worries of the ordinary man that wakes up every day either sick or hungry and runs to the palace. And whether I like it or not, I must do something. Even if I don't have it, I must borrow. If I don't, I must sell one of my gowns to provide for the ordinary man. I said, this is a thought of some of us who are responsible for a people that God has ordained we should lead. But if there is an attitude that the ordinary Nigerian is saved, and his survival is made the priority of policymakers and the nation. It is an opportunity that, as a people, the ordinary Nigerian takes lead as a priority in policy formulation and implementation. If those in charge of governance, whether at state, local, or federal, would think that if the ordinary man in Nigeria survives, that is a major success of any administration. I say, if we are lucky to begin to get this positive disposition towards what national responsibilities are, then perhaps there won't be any need. Like Professor from the University of Benin said, we won't have to amass heavy war machinery to quell protest or rebellion. The whole weight of confusion we're having in this country, whether it is ethnic, whether it is a farmer and heather, whether it is one tribe against the other is all a reaction of frustration, of hopelessness, and lack of any hope that the life of the person reacting might see good not to talk of his own children and grandchildren. I think this country is one of the most endowed nations in the world. There are very, very few countries who have the kind of vast mineral resources that Nigeria has. The intellectuals that Nigeria as a nation has produced and will produce our mental human capacity as a people is among the best rated in the world. In any field of human endeavor you go, from medicine to humanities, from the sciences, 
Nigerians are among the best endowed in the world. Unfortunately, if we are outside Nigeria, we are rated among the achievers. But the ones who step back in the soils of Afar and Nigeria were among those that destroyed this nation. I'm wondering what the problem is. Why should we toil and serve and make other nations better? And when we come back home, our priorities change. I'm just hoping. Like I left my friend and my dear brother, Professor Galadima, wondering what that our conversation will lead to. When, what nips can bring up that the lives and hopes of the Nigerian people and especially the ordinary man and by implication the larger nation, Nigeria and Nigerians. What will it be if we have a better positive attitude towards making the human capital development whether from a privileged home or the ordinary, like Professor Egu said some of them from peasant home and some Abu Ghalajima from a moderate medium class family that we're able to come up with an opportunity that wherever and irrespective of your family background, as a Nigerian, you have, an, you, have, you, have, you have limitless opportunity to contribute to the growth of Nigeria, and Nigeria will ensure your well-being as best as any human being in the world will have been accorded. I thought to only speak in gratitude sincerely for the package of thoughts that has brought this gathering in honor of our dear friend and brother. We have never met with him without cracking our kind of jokes. First, we'll measure our heights, whether he's still growing or I'm still growing. Secondly, I'm one among many of our friends that whether we like it or not, we must look for each other's troubles before and as soon as we meet and before we separate. And with a very heavy heart. When I learned that the time has come and my brother is gone, I knew that it's a responsibility that is so enormous that during his days, I know he has championed. Even when the father was alive, the package of the responsibility of the whole of the father's family was on Abu Ghalajima. I knew him even while we were students, he would still be consulting with the father on the upbringing of his younger ones. Even when we graduated and he started working as a graduate assistant with the Department of Political Science, and some of us, then, some of us joined then, they call it National Electoral Commission. Abu Ghaladima had most of his younger ones that the father was training, joined him in the house that the father bought and kept them at the Cafe. And while he graduated and moved further, they moved to the course. In other words, until the time Abu Ghalajima died as DG, he doesn't have a house of his own that he has bought. So as of today, I'm sure, except that the family will have returned to the house that the father bought, the family wouldn't have a home. Because that was the first thing I asked when I came here after his death. Where are you people going to move to? Now that he's no mother, because he doesn't have any house of his own. So when I saw graciously Prof mentioning that there was a package of intention. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. I, I got carried away. I'm taking into every time. My apologies sincerely. But let me round up by joining Prof that those kids from a man who was selfless. I'm sure those of you that work with him know, know him better. Uh, I've been in the palace 16 years, so I'm sure I do not know a lot of things. But I know, up to the time he left his office as a director general, he didn't send one grain of maize or rice to the palace, so I know he doesn't have anything. But the family and the kids must go. The kids should have an opportunity graciously from the magnanimity of those of us who live with him and love him and related with him that their lives can never be hopeless because their father is normal. I'm sure some of us, no matter how little, will be gracious in support of Aisha and the kids that Abu has left behind. Sincerely, 
I thank you, my brother, the DG, for having us in mind and calling us to join this important outing. And on my behalf, and some of us who are his friends, Roger Gofoim, Professor Roger Gofoim is one of us, uh, and uh, Barrister Caleb Dajan is one of us as friends of Abu Ghaladima, who didn't report science but related to him severally. Uh, we are grateful for this opportunity of bringing the Nis family to pay tribute to our dear friend and brother that was a part of the Nis family. We thank you sincerely for your time. Can we please appreciate His Royal Highness with another round of applause? Okay, without much ado, to pay their tribute also to late Professor Abu Shaibu Galadima, is the Alumni Association of the National Institute, ANI, who is ably represented here today by the Vice President of ANI, Ambassador Emmanuel Obi Okafor, MNI. Please give him a round of applause as he comes up. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Acting Director General, due to time constraint, permit me to stand on the well-established protocol. From the outset, I would like to commend the Acting DG and the management staff, as well as the Committee of Friends for organizing this very important event. Professor Abu. Shaibu Galadima means many things to many people. To us members of the Alumni Association, he surely can be termed as an enigma. A man who put both passion and zeal in what he believes in. He envisaged a national institute that will be ranked third in Africa and even one of the top most five in the whole world. When Professor Galadima was appointed as Director General of the National Institute, many people applauded the appointment, hailing his choice in view of his commitment and dedication to the cause of the Institute. As the Director of Research, he was instrumental to many changes the Institute experienced, and the oncoming on board as the substantive DG, that gave him the opportunity to concretize some of the dreams he had. Gladema approached his job with the commitment he deserves, always smiling and ensuring that he gives both participants and staff the desired attention and assurances that things will work for the better. He mobilized his contacts and friends for the development of the infrastructure and physical facilities at the National Institute. He inculcated a spirit of service and sacrifice in both public service or anyone he came in contact with. Surely, the National Institute has missed a very great man, a bridge builder, and a man ready to put his all to the service of his fatherland. We can only draw solace from knowing that he left indelible marks during his tenure. As we collectively mourn his demise, we are not too downcast, knowing that for everything, there is a season and time, including death. The Alumni Association bids farewell to an accomplished and outstanding administrator and a great Nigerian. We pray that Almighty Allah grant him Aljana Fidaus. Adieu, Professor Galadina. Can we please appreciate the Vice President of the Alumni Association with another round of applause. Thank you, sir. Okay, quickly to also honor late Professor Abu Shaibu Gayladima with their tribute 
is the Embassy of People's Republic of China in Nigeria, ably represented by Mr. Du Sheng, and he's going to do that via Zoom. Mr. Du Sheng, please. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Let me just turn off my speaker. Okay, hello, just uh, everyone, and good afternoon. Just uh, uh, Your Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, and also the uh, Acting DG of the National Institute. And due to the uh, time limitation given to me by the organizer uh, on my tributes, I have to skip over the protocol. And uh, my name is Du Sheng, and uh, I'm the director of the political, political section of the embassy. So thank you so much for inviting us to this uh, very, very important memorial and uh, tributes and lecture in the honor of the late Professor Habu Karadima. Today I'm here not only as a representative of the embassy, but also and mainly as a friend and younger brother of late Professor Karadima. First of all, on behalf of, of the embassy, I'd like to express once again our deep sorrow and sadness over the sudden passing of Professor Galadima, a good friend of China and also a good partner of the embassy. I have been working in Nigeria for more than two years. At the early times of my stay here, I and Professor Galadima made, made good friends and we supported and helped each other discuss ideas and plans to boost the think tanks, exchanges, and communications between our two countries. All of which would definitely be part of my happy memories of working in Nigeria. Professor Gladima was a very diligent and industrious leading official in the National Institute. Last year, for the preparation of the study tour to China by participants of the yearly senior executive course, he communicated with me over all the planning issues and even came to me for advisory over the route planning in China and the proposed cities to be visited. However, it's a pity for both of us that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the tour did not come true. Professor, Professor Gradima was also a leading official with a strategic vision. Last March, I accompanied my former ambassador of China to Nigeria to visit the National Institute. And during the tour, Professor and my ambassador unveiled together the Chinese Study Center of the National Institute. According to my knowledge, that was the first one set up within the governmental and official think tanks in Nigeria. This achievement was largely owed to the efforts and leadership of Professor Galadima. Excellencies and dear friends, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between Nigeria and China. My embassy will continue our efforts to enhance the think tank and wisdom communications, as well as people-to-people -people exchanges between our two countries, especially to do whatever we can to support the capacity building of the National Institute and facilitate its exchange programs with the, with the Chinese counterparts. Uh, may his gentle soul rest in peace. And I also wish the National Institute success in its future endeavors. Thank you. We appreciate you, Mr. Du Zheng. Zie Zie Ni Zie Sheng. Okay. So to take the, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to take the tribute for European Union support for democratic governance is their representative, Mrs. Laolu Olaumi, who is also the project manager. 
And she's going to be doing that um, via Zoom too. Are you ready, Mrs. Laulu Olaumi? Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Can you okay, hear me? Okay, thank you. Okay, so you can start. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Korean um, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Again, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the opportunity to speak at this party. Um, Professor Abu Baladina was a very well respected member of the EU SDGN family and is very sorely missed. Um, the European Union funded support to democratic governance in Nigeria program is made up of institution working to strengthen Nigeria's democratic process. And this group, which was a purely technical group, sort of morphed into a strategic um, yet familial arrangement with, with PROF at the core of our operations. Um, PROF was instrumental in shaping the strategic direction of our work with political parties. It was deeply committed to the core values of political participation and internal party democracy and provided its leadership in the establishment of the political parties leadership and policy development center at NIPS, which continues to facilitate dialogue and drive policy engagement at the national level. One of the many qualities that struck me um, knowing and working with Prof was his kindness. He always had a good word, no matter the circumstances and the pressures he faced. He was also very humble. I have never seen this kind of humility or experienced it. He was such a humble man and related with people with utmost respect, regardless of age, religion, or station. We were very delighted at his appointment as the DG of NIPS, and we had assumed that this would mark his natural exit from our group. So imagine when our usual meeting date rolled by and there he was in his seat on his usual side of the room. Such was this man, with his quiet presence and infectious grace, urging you to do better, to work harder, to be more committed, and to find innovative yet challenging ways to address issues. His presence and his demeanor had a calming effect on most of us, particularly in the midst of you know, what is often considered a very highly complex political environment. Prof leaves behind a legacy of intellectual and professional rigor that the European Support to Democratic Governance team will strive to uphold. On behalf of my colleagues, I would like to convey our most sincere condolences to his immediate family. I, I simply cannot imagine um, what you must be going through. But I would also like to express our sincere condolences to the management and staff of NIPS, most of whom we have come to um, work with very closely and respect a lot. Today, I pray that his soul will continue to rest in peace and may the, that may the good Lord in his infinite mercies continue to uphold his family and grant the fortitude to carry on his legacy. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma. To also pay their tribute is another development partner of, and is from MacArthur Foundation and they are represented by Dr. Kole Shetima. Dr. Kole Shetima, please. Oh, he's going to do it via Zoom, okay. Dr. Kole Shetima, are you ready? Um, first of all, I, 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 I want to I apologize that um, I couldn't uh, be in person, but I want to convey uh, our condolence and sympathy to the members of the family, and of course to his colleagues at the Institute. Um, we have been working with Professor Galadima uh, for a very long time. Uh, personally, I have worked with him on a number of several issues. Uh, anything that has to do with development and fees and security of our people. Uh, Professor Galadima has always been uh, among the frontline intellectuals and workers. And that is what really have brought us together. Um, uh, about two or three years ago, specifically, um, I think that uh, the foundation 
uh, started some doing some work around behavioral change uh, uh, and behavioral science and public policy. And we are very excited to see Prop uh, and two of his other colleagues joining us in this conversation. Um, before his death, um, we started talking about uh, working together on this issue and how do we establish a program at NIPS on behavioral insights into public policy. Uh, unfortunately, um, his, uh, his passing on uh, briefly interrupted the process, uh, but we at the foundation are very determined that even if to memorialize him, to remember him, uh, to continue with the good work that he has started, we will continue to do this work at NIPS, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to support NIPS uh, as part of our own contribution towards um, uh, the good work that he's doing. Um, I'm so, uh, he may be gone, uh, but I think that the work that he has started, uh, we see the one to see that uh, we continue it in whatever form that we can. So let me join uh, others also to convey uh, our sympathy to the family um, and, uh, and, 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 and wish them uh, God's uh, comfort at this very difficult time. And we hope that uh, Allah will find uh, the support and solace and others that will come to them and, and make their life easier uh, for him as well and, and the rest of the, uh, his family members that he has left behind. Uh, thank you very much, and um, we wish um, everyone uh, who's there um, all the support that they need in order to continue with the work that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next on the list is the Development Research and Project Center, DRPC Abuja, and they are represented here today by the project manager, Dr. Stanley Upai. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the brevity of time, please permit me to stand on existing protocols. Um, on behalf of Dr. Judith Ann Walker, the Executive Director of uh, Development Research and Project Center, uh, permit me to present this tribute. Uh, we fondly remember Professor Habu uh, Galadima as an administrator and erudite scholar uh, at the DRPC. Um, Everybody knows that for NIPS, uh, before a policy is presented or formulated, they, they go through the whole motion of spending a year to dig deep and then come up with uh, recommendations. Uh, with Professor Habu Galadima as the Director General, he opened the door to a uh, different uh, perspective, hence evidencing his uh, scholarly uh, nature. He opened the door to uh, the third sector, which is the development world, uh, so that the participants of NIPS can get the perspective of civil society organizations. And for us, what that did was present us with an opportunity uh, for civil society partners, civil society uh, players to have government dialogue in a room. Uh, for us, we would never forget that opportunity. Uh, he was gracious to allow for the Development Research and Project Center to partner with NIPS on so many issues and so many fronts. Uh, we will remember him fondly and we continue to pray for the family uh, and the National Institute. Uh, the DG will sorely be missed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DRPC. Let me at this point invite uh, the DG of the Institute of Peace and Conflict Resolution, Abuja, in the person of Professor Bakut, Bakut, to give his tribute, please. I think I'm one of the most luckiest people to have met Professor Habu Galadima. As I just returned from Europe, 
um, took up an appointment with the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, resumed in 2003, and then he came, 2004, for sabbatical. I had been in Europe for about 15 years before coming back. Within that period, I did not visit Nigeria, I did not even visit Africa. So coming back was a contrast for me. But then, I saw this gentleman. He wasn't a staff of the institute, but on sabbatical. And his life affected me. From then, I began to study him, to try and be like him. The grace with which he walks, and the focus to the work. He came across different from me, uh, from the other colleagues that were in the institute. So I cultivated the habit of trying to work with him to understand. And I always go to his office because I was a, a chief, I mean, I was a chief research officer, level 14, and he was level 15, of course, my senior. So I always go to him to try and learn from him what he was doing. Then he finished and he left back to the University of Jos. I was invited to a training on leadership and human rights in Ethiopia. Lo and behold, there he was. Now, the first time we are going to spend time together. And I can assure you that he affected my life. From that moment, I began to understand that. Because when I came back to Nigeria, I really didn't have intention of staying back. That I was just, okay, do what I have to do and then get back to England or Europe or anywhere. But I saw that there can be people who are really, really serious and hungry for the development of this country. And therefore, I became like he's an apprentice. And he took me as his own. From then, we developed friendship. My, relationship, my friendship with him is not like those of you that had the opportunity to grow up with him. Now, mine was like, it's a relationship between a scholar that I have respect for. And he, for some reason, sees somebody that he probably wanted to learn something from. Or somebody he can uh, help to develop. And that is how we develop, we continue working. He made sure he included me in everything that was being done uh, when he became uh, the, uh, the director of uh, research in, the, uh, in, in NIPS. So we developed that program and then we worked together on the project which uh, Professor Kelebe has talked about on uh, uh, small harms and light weapons. So I found myself working with him and the more I work with him, the more I, I learn from him. He really, really is missed by me, and I know that his uh, family miss him more. But for some of us who he became an inspiration for, uh, we definitely, I did not want to believe that he had gone. It took me so many days to actually accept that. But I want to say that Professor Galadima was somebody that I will miss. And I pray that the Almighty Allah will grant him a jinnah for those. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Waiting to take his tribute is Dr. Abubakar Sukutu Muhammad, MNI.
Usman Danfudio University, as you can see, is actually in a convocation regalia. Dr. Abubakar Sukutu Mohamed, are you ready, sir? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, you're welcome, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, sir. Can I? Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pardon my appearance in borrowed robes. Uh, this is because right now we are having our uh, convocation, first convocation ceremony at the Sokoto State University, where I'm a council member. So I will quickly put forward my uh, thought tribute on uh, late Professor Abu Ladima. Well, I attended Ahmad Bello University Zaria, and I worked in Zaria after graduating in 1975 uh, as a lecturer in the Department of Sociology. In 1987, I moved to NIPS, Kuru, and that is when I came to JAWS. And that was the beginning of my association with Professor Habu Galadima of blessed memory. And the platform on which we met was the Institute of Governance and Social Research, which is headed by its president, Professor Jonah Isawa Ilaibu. And we worked with Professor Ilaibu on IGSR along with Professor Habu Galadima with other colleagues, such as Professor Pam Dung Shah, the present director of research, Professor Audu Gambo, the directing staff, uh, Dr. Musa Omar, the uh, chief operating officer, Ms. Julie Sander, Dr. Philip and others. Well, these were people who initiated me, uh, Abu Galadima, and I felt very much at home. And some of the activities we carried out together were we did carry out projects for various organizations under the IGSR such as the NDP, we did carry out projects on political parties, of course, on the proliferation of uh, small arms and light weapons, in conflicts between herders and farmers. And also, IGSR organized annual lectures in which prominent statesmen, both national and international, were invited to make presentations. And we helped in organizing these lectures meticulously over the years. We had, with the return to uh, democracy also, IGSR played a very important role because we carried out a lot of sensitization programs. For example, there was one on civil-military relations. Now that we have come to uh, democracy, mili military rule is no longer fashionable. And how do the military relate to the civilian politicians? We also did organize uh, legislature executive relations because it's a new thing. Uh, the executive were not accustomed to working with the legislature and it was necessary to organize sensitization seminars. We did also, also organize one on police army relations in internal security operations. And in all this, Professor Abu Galadima was very hardworking, amiable, cooperative, a team player, and somebody who you never see get annoyed. Of course, he can get annoyed with uh, inefficiency, but on the whole, he was an amiable colleague to work with. Then the next platform on which we met was that of the University of Jos. Of course, I was an external examiner to the Department of Sociology, and uh, the seminars and public lectures that were organized by the university, I was invited. And also, uh, I did meet with uh, Professor Abu Galadima on this platform. The Fulbright Association also, we have a lot. Okay, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate um, Dr. Abubakar Sukutu's uh, contribution. We have on Zoom with us um, Professor Olu Abafemi. He was one time the director of research. Prof, are you? Can you hear me, Professor Olu Abafemi? Professor Olu Abafemi, can you hear me? While we wait for Professor Luba Femi to, to join up, may I call out the representative of the University of Jos to give their tribute? University of Jos, please. Is he back? Can I continue, please? 
Oh, okay. You can quickly round up, sir. I'm, I'm back. Please, can I round up? Yes, just round up, sir. Yes. So thank you very much. And uh, just as I was leaving NIPS, uh, Professor Habugaladima joined NIPS because he was a senior research department. He came, became chief operating officer of PPL PDC. He became the director of research, and eventually he got to the top as the director general of National Institute. Of course, all this is a tribute to him because of his hard work, his uh, pension. And uh, since I left NIPS, Professor Abu Galadima has kept me in touch with NIPS through invitations for seminars, roundtables, and conferences. And whenever I'm able to, I make the sacrifice to make sure that I don't feel given my 20 years plus uh, link with uh, Annie. Now, let me, sorry, with uh, NIPS. Now, finally, let me talk about the personal qualities of the uh, gentleman. Professor Abu Galadima was knowledgeable and unassuming. He was meticulous, efficient, and hardworking. He was also organized with the penchant for details. He was friendly and trustworthy. He has an excellent sense of humor, and he was jovial. Not only that, he also had an excellent sense of dress. Whether it was national dress or Western dress, he came out meticulously. But finally, eventually, this professional association landed us into family ties. At one point, Professor Abu Galadima decided he wanted to bring his daughter to Usman Namfodio University in Sokoto to come and study. And he sent his wife and the daughter to me and to my family while we were trying to find accommodation for her. And this showed the extent of trust and confidence he had in me. And also, I never, uh, in fact, failed in trying to answer to his calls and to standing up to his, uh, to his, uh, to his, uh, to his demands. Uh, with these few remarks, I want to pray to God to grant him Janatul Firdaus, to also bless his family, and to make sure that uh, they succeed in life as he succeeded. He has left a model for all the staff in NIPS, for his colleagues in Unijos, and also for his family. And with this, we say, may God bless him in his final abode. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much, the Director General uh, Brigadier Udaya. Thank you very much, sir. The spirit of NIPS family. So can we have a representative from the University of Jos to make it, to give their tribute? University of Jos, please. Okay, while they get ready, um, let me invite um, Dr. Leonard Ezinwa, the chairman of Interparty Advisory Council, IPAC. Is he in the house? Please bring him up. Okay. We're running behind time, so if we can just do this within two minutes, sir. Thank you. Kindly permit me to stand on the existing protocol. Um, if there's one particular man that has impacted my life in so short a time, is that of Professor Habu Galadima. I say this with all respect, with all humility, for a man that within a few months shaped my worldview about Nigerian political parties and also how it should be done. I'll just quickly do this because of the time. We are diminished further by Habu's transition. The date 16th December, the date 16th and 17th December, 2020, were days that the Interparty Advisory Council, the body of political parties in Nigeria, would never forget in a hurry. We had converged in Nikon Luxury, Abuja, for annual summit of political parties and stakeholders meeting with the team two decades of party, party politics and democracy in Nigeria issues and prospects. All shades of party politics issues were thoroughly dissected and plausible solutions were offered under the guidance of Professor Galadima during the meet. And here was Professor Habo Galadima, 
the Director General of National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, sitting at the front row, watching with excitement, at the front row, watching with excitement as event unfolded after presenting his open remark for the program. Professor Galadima looked intently at the podium where speakers and speakers walked in and out with a smile sitting on his face, even as he never showed it. Professor Habu Galadima loves what he does. He enjoys his job as, as a rebellious scholar of immense stature that delights in ventilating deep knowledge as well as grounding it practically. He was an effusive, touring, domineering academic Iroko tree that branched out in many areas and rooted in many of the scholars and part participants here present today and many outside this place who continue to mourn him in this transition. Indeed, there was only one happiness in his life, to love and be loved, and the loved academics and scholarship and persons involved in advancing its frontiers. Professor Halu Habu Galadima was a great man, a wonderful intellect, a, gross, a great soul of matchless courage, one of the great men of our time, and yet we have no right to bow down to his memory simply because he was a great man, he was a great man, great administrator, great leader, often used their gifts for most unholy cause. But we meet today to pay a tribute of love and respect to Professor Habu Galadima because he used his matchless power for the good of men. This good man carved his name on hearts and not on tombstones. He has left a legacy that is etched into the minds of many of us and made this institute a world-class edifice that we continue to produce great minds that will build our great nation. The Inter-Party Advisory Council has just, was just leaving the, the Abuja program when his demise was communicated to us. Many of us had broken, shut down for days to mourn and honor him. To date, many great leaders, still, party leaders still ask me if indeed Professor Galadima has translated. One of them captured it more vividly Oh, this man of simplicity has left us. A great patriot, eminent intellectual, esteemed scholar, prominent bridge builder, astute administrator, a passionate nationalist who devoted his life in service for us. We, the political party, its leaders, the nation, and humanity is gone. Professor Habu Galadema, simplicity and humbleness is unequaled. He called me aside and told me, that he is very happy with the outcome of our last engagement in Abuja. Leonard, I am very happy with what has happened in this program today. Come and see me as soon as possible when I get to Kuru as I go back. That's what he said to me. Unknown to me, this was the last time I will see Professor Galadema. Today, the inter party Advisory Council remembers Professor Galadema for the establishment of the political parties, leadership, and policy development center of NIPS, which is served as, a, as the pioneer chief operating officer, promoting multi-party democracy, growth, and good health of political parties in Nigeria. His effort reflected in improved leadership, alertness, decorum, decency, and near sanity in which party leaders engage in partisan politics. This is also helping in reduction of intra- and inter-party squabbles. The parties also remember Professor Harbour as it adopted the effective crisis management and alternate dispute resolution mechanism learned from various trainees by NIPS that has tremendously helped political party administrators in the discharge of duties. It's been difficult to believe that this amiable, erudite, and quintessential scholar has translated. Indeed, Professor Harbour's transition after our Abuja program is a big blow to political parties in particular, and the nation he served with all his might. We take solace, therefore, in the fact that he lived a life worthy of emulation, contributed immensely to scholarship and knowledge, and will be remembered for his passion for capacity development of leaders of political parties in particular, and eminent Nigerians in the military, paramilitary, public and private sectors for future national duties. We lost a good man that has been duly measured credibly in this celebration, in this inaugural memorial lecture. It is my honor to also extend the deepest of condolences to the family 
and the parties in Nigeria will do the needful to see how they will support the family and the institute in this regard. May God and may his rose rest in perfect peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, IPAC. May I, at this point, invite the representative of the Institute of Governance and Social Research, Dr. Adele Kezi, in the house, please. You're welcome, sir. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Indeed, I'm here to represent the President IGSR, Professor Isawa Ilagu. He actually wanted to be here himself, but he couldn't make it. Where I sat down quietly, people have made references to him and Professor Abu Galadima. I was here to represent him on Saturday when the last batch of graduates left. When I, when I was about leaving, I just went to Prof. I said, Prof, I want to go. He said, ah, doctor, you are here. Please take very good care of, Prof., uh, of Professor Eliagu for me, as if he knew he was going to die. That was his statement on that, on that day, that Saturday. Then on Sunday, when I saw the news, I, was, I just came out from my room, opened my phone, about reading news, I saw Professor Galadima has died. It was a real shock to me as a person. And I found it very difficult to call my boss, that is Professor Isawa Ileagu, because I knew the way he would take it, not knowing that already he has been formed. Around 8 o'clock, he called. Doctor Adedeji, where are you? I said, Prof, I'm around. And then my heart started beating rapidly. Whether this man has had this thing. Why was I doing this? It was because I know the relationship between him and Professor Galadima. He said, my son is gone. I said, Prof, I've had it. He said, what do we do? I said, for now, there is nothing we can do. Because God doesn't make mistakes. He gives and he takes. He said, I should repeat myself. I said, Prof, God doesn't make mistakes. He gives and he takes whenever he wants. Professor Galadima has lived his own life. It was his time to go, and that was why he left. I tried to console Professor Ilagu until Monday when we met. I went to meet him, I went to his house. I said, Prof, it happened, there is nothing we can do. He said, yes, I have taken it, like you said, is the will of God. May so rest in peace. I got to know Professor Abu Galadima 11 years ago, when I was with the Citizenship and Leadership Training Center then. It was through Professor Elaygo that I got to know him. When Prof asked me to come and represent him, and he gave me the letter, I saw the first lecture of the topic. That was the same topic Prof came to Citizenship and Leadership Training Center to deliver. So I want to congratulate the organizers of this program. I know Prof is gone, but he will continue to remain with us. The, all, the, all what people have said about him, they are true. He was a man of integrity. He is somebody that can be trusted. He was a good a teacher, because people call it lecturer. If prof is teaching you, he wants you to grab everything. Um, most importantly, Professor Galadima was time conscious. He was somebody that doesn't joke with time. I remember prof has invited him several occasions to IGSR to come and give us lecture, especially any time we are having capacity building program. Prof will always come at least 15 minutes to the lecture period. This we cherish about him, and we continue to emulate him. 
he was just a gentleman. I want to join others too to pray that may Allah give him eternal rest. And may God take very good care of his immediate family. Thanks and God bless us. Thank you very much, IGSR. May I at this point request the representative of Zang Old Students Association, ZOSA, to give their tribute, please. Your yeah, Excellency, sir, the Executive Governors of Plateau and Dasarawa States, the Acting Director General of NIPS, retired Brigadier Chikomeka Udaya, our Royal Highnesses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to fill the gap between the primary school, Shafa Abakwa and the Federal College of Arts and Science, Seleja. That is, the Zhang Old Students Association, where late Professor Abu Galirima attended his secondary school in Bukuru. Professor Abu Galadima was looked at as a shy and quiet student, but we understood him to be a very good listener. He loved our dance school uniform of white, which was later to become his favorite color. He was not much into sports, but enjoyed playing table tennis. Being, the quiet, being on the quiet side, he was a very meticulous student. His social life was calculative. He showed determination for studies, above all, he was so committed to his own religion. Late Professor Abu Galadima was a goal getter. He applied himself maximally in all assignments that were given him and usually completed them in good record time to the admiration and satisfaction of those that entrusted him with those tasks. A very sound and refined academician, he taught and mentored so many. He was a consummate and compassionate public servant a brilliant person who was freely, who was, who freely shared his opinion on issues that affected development, politics, and economy. His appointment, therefore, as the Director General of NIPS was, not, was as a result of his hard work, commitment, dedication, and assigned respons responsibilities. His short period as Director General in NIPS witnessed massive infrastructural and human capital development, all with the hope of making NIPS one of the best research institutes in Africa. His family will surely miss him. Zhang Old Students Association will miss him. The association could he had promised to take to the next level by enrolling scholarships for the benefit of indigent but brilliant students. He had promised that he would leave his mark on the infrastructures of his alma mater, the Zang Secondary Commercial School, Bukuru. Alas, we cannot realize this any longer. We shall all miss him. May the legacies he left behind in NIPS be improved upon for the benefit of humanity and to the glory of God. The intellectual giant has gone to rest. May his gentle soul continue to enjoy eternal peace. Adieu, Professor Habu. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Zhang Old Students Association. We will at this point um, invite the representative of the senior staff of the National Institute. As, uh, do we have um, Mr. Bamiyi Adonai? Adanoi, I beg your pardon, in the house. The chairman, 
of NIPS Senior Senior Staff Association, I beg your pardon, Mr. Sonigia. Yes, Mr. Sonigia. Please, just a minute. And as he comes, can we have um, the NASU rep, the chairman of NASU, Mr. Bamei Adenai? Adanoi, please. Just come so that you take it almost back to back. Please, just a minute, please. Thank you. Permit me to stand on existing protocol. Uh, Apex Think Tank Institute, Policy Institute. Those were his words. He wants to take NIPS to become one of the Apex Think Tank in Africa without forgetting the welfare of the members of staff. Each time I come to him, he will say, Sonny, what are the implementation strategies? I'm sure our new participants might not be too aware of this, but subsequently you will get to know. If you bring a problem, profile a solution. That was how he was. We will miss him. May his soul rest in peace. Our prayer in Nips is that whosoever is going to step into his shoes will build on the legacies he has laid. Thank you. Thank you. To say something about the late Professor Habu Garadima is very difficult to the non-academic staff union of the National Institute. As he assumed the office less than two months, he said, Comrade, I know what is in your mind, why you bring your people here for this welcome meeting. Condition of service. I said, yes, sir. Welfare of the staff. I say, yes, sir. But what do you see in other place that we adopt for the condition of service of the National Institute to be better? I say, sir, please, the best thing is setting up the committee. Less than two more, the committee was set up and the journey began. We just round up the paperwork and he promised to follow it up for us to laugh in 2021, but 20th of December 2020, he left. Our prayer is that may his soul rest in peace. Please, those that take this higher and respective shoe from him, help us and continue with his promises so that his promise will not go in vain. As Moses died, Joshua continued from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is just the best place to anchor the tributes. Thank you, Nasu Chairman. So we have gradually come to the end of this um, a solemn assembly. May I request a representative of the family in the person of Mrs. Mary Galadima, who is wife to our lady G's uncle, Justice Galadima, to give a vote of thanks. You're welcome, ma. Please be careful. Thank you, ma'am. His Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, the Governors of Plateau and Nasara States, Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished uh, our, the, the command, the director, the acting director of the institute, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is not easy for me to stand here as a mother of Habu to give, to say something about his demise. Because deep inside me and deep inside the family members. Abu is still around. So it's a hard thing. But then we must accept reality of the situation. I wish to invite members of the Galadima family to stand up wherever they are for recognition.
Please, you can take your seats. These are just a handful, in fact, less than a handful of the members of the family of Abu, Professor Abu. He was a son, a loving son to all of us. He was a brother, he was a husband, a cousin, a nephew, and all. And he made sure he touched the lives of every family member in whatever way possible. We thank God for the life of Abu. It was short, but very meaningful. We, we know that here in the Institute, he has left a lasting legacy here. And it is our desire as a family, the family of Abu, to make sure that all those beautiful tributes that have been said about him, those that were at the level of being implemented would not be KIV'd. Well, that's civil service language. Shouldn't be kept in view forever and ever. It is our prayer and desire that some of them, if not all, would be implemented in his memory. Also, the family, a lot has been said about the family particularly the wife and the young children. I have personally witnessed occasions where tributes are paid to serving officers. And after such glowing tributes, the matter is dropped and forgotten about. I pray as a mother to Abu, that this, all that Abu has done and all that has been said about him and considering the how much he has put in, his family, immediate family I mean, would not be forgotten. Every, like the Emir of Doma said, it is our prayer that the family will be well taken care of, the widow and the children of Abu. A lot has already been said about Abu, which there's no need to repeat because he was part and parcel of our lives, everyday lives, right from his tender age to this time, and we thank God that he has made us proud in the family. He was like a, a torch, a light that shone through darkness, and he has exposed the family in such a beautiful uh, light. We are so proud of him. As the scripture says, there's time for everything. There's time to be born and time to die. It has come to his time to go. And we are thankful for the, to the Lord for the time, the kind of service, the kind of life Abu lived. From his personal private life to his public life. He has done us proud. And we thank God to identify with that as a family. For those of us traveling this afternoon, we wish you very safe journey and God's protection and safe arrival to your respective destinations. Thank you very much for making us proud as a family and thank you very much for all that has been said and done. And we thank the uh, acting DG
for making this one of his very major responsibilities in NIPS. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Ma, for that vote of thanks. And this brings us to the end of this um, occasion. Before um, we take the national anthem, let me quickly announce that we have, um, before that, let me um, appreciate each and every one of you from, for, for coming. And for those whose names we fail to call out, please, you are most welcome and appreciated. Let me quickly announce that we have lunch. As soon as we take the national anthem and leave this place, there's lunch for our invited guest at the Nips restaurant. And we have tea outside the hall for our guests, I mean, our, our staff. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of this occasion. You are welcome. Please rise for the national anthem. Thank you very much.